at this time. It is recording. All right, so we're going to talk about environmental assessment because um, it ties into home health, right? So environmental assessment is where we are going to assess somebody's either home environment, work environment, something to that effect. Um, so what are the kind of the roles that we do as PTAs in environmental assessment? Talk about the importance of environmental accessibility, patient function, how to look at some instruments, uh, identify strategies to improve function, and then also complete environmental assessment at home. So the main idea for our environmental assessment is we're looking at what could be a barrier to patient function, just like anything else. Um, PTAs and PTs that do environmental assessment, really, it's kind of a nice gig. Um, a lot of times you have to see a lot in a day in order to make decent money doing it. But a lot of times what you're doing is you're literally just going in and seeing if the environment is safe enough for a patient to go home to. Um, so what kind of stuff, the physical environment, right? We obviously have to assess the building. What do we look like? Where are they living? Um, Anything that's created by humans, we have to assess sidewalks, walkways, everything. And then we also have to assess what's out in nature, right? Not so much in this town, but where I'm from, you know, there may not be a sidewalk to somebody's home. There may not be, you know, there may not even be a paved road, to be 100% honest. A lot of where I come from, the roads are kind of just stones and they're more of a suggestion than they are a road. You know, you go that way and sometimes, you know, you'll find what you're looking for. I've had patients describe to me that you hang a right at the third sycamore tree to get to my house. That's assuming that I have an idea what a sycamore tree is in the first place. Um, but you have to assess that stuff too, right? I've had patients that, you know, have really elaborate gardens and I have to tell them, well, it's going to be a barrier for you to get home. So they have to kind of know what's going on. And also other people. Uh, kind of looking at what's going on outside. So what can, what are some physical things that could possibly affect a patient's ability to function in his or her surroundings? What are some stuff that maybe prevent them from doing normal activities that you, that you take for granted, you're okay with, but maybe not something stairs, right? Yeah, steps. Using the toilet, right, especially if it's, you know, one of those toilets that are on the floor. I don't know why they ever designed those in the first place. Um, sinks, right? What if your sink is here? Yeah, reaching into cabinets. Your cabinets are up here and you're in a wheelchair now. All that has to be kind of assessed. Little rat dogs, yep. And then also little evil cats. Um, I like cats, but cats are also just as likely to try to kill you as love you. Uh, furniture's too high or low. Yeah, right? I've come into some patients' bedrooms where their bed is five feet off the ground. I don't understand that either. Um, but toilets on the floor can be found in China. Those, yeah, thick rugs and carpet. Good. So you guys got the idea. Any of those are valid assessments. So we literally have to go in and we have to play a little bit of Sherlock Holmes, right? We have to look at the stuff and look at it from a perspective of our patient, not from us. You know, walking around my apartment here that I live in, the carpet wasn't that big of a deal to me. I can walk around and function. But when my ex-wife lived with me and she was in a wheelchair, yeah, the carpet was a pain in the butt. Um, it's not thick carpet, but it's that shaggy carpet that gets stuck in everything. So it was a pain in the butt for her to wheel around in a wheelchair. In. Um, we had to get different wheels for her wheelchair. To get in and out of the apartment here, I don't know who designed my door, but I just about have to go through it sideways. I couldn't take her through the wheelchair and I had to collapse, put, stop the wheelchair, lift her up, take her in, put her in a wheelchair in the house, and then collapse her wheelchair outside and hope that the, one of the homeless people didn't steal it. Um, but there's all kinds of safety issues and stuff that can cause access problems, right? So the Fair Housing Amendment Act of 1988 says that we cannot discriminate on somebody due to disability. So let's say you come to my apartment complex here, and it's not mine, mind you, but the one I live in. Or better yet, you, you want to rent my house from me down in Tucson. Don't ever do that. I'm a horrible landlord. Um, but you want to rent your house, my house from me. If you come in to meet with me to rent the house and you're in a wheelchair, I can't look at you any differently than I would look at somebody that is fully able-bodied, right? But do you think that happens? What do you think? Yeah, it does. 
because for those patients with disabilities, American with Disabilities Act says that if I, if I have a person that moves in that is handicapable or has some sort of a disability, I have to make reasonable accommodations for those people in my apartment or my house or whatever it is to allow them to go up and down stairs, stuff like that. So let's say I do, I, I have a tenant that wants to rent my home down in Tucson. And the home down in Tucson is a two bedroom, uh, three bed, or I'm sorry, two, three bedroom, two bath house. It's two stories. And the patient's in a wheelchair. And they come to me and say, I can't do stairs. You have to put a stair lift in for me. Is that a reasonable accommodation request? What do you guys think? You think that would be reasonable of them to ask of me? Well, some of you say no, but you'd be, you'd be really surprised to find out. It's a yes. That's a reasonable request, right? It's a lot of money. Um, you know, average chairlift's about $3,500, $4,500, right? But the good news is the government has all kinds of grants and stuff like that to help me make a set, or to make changes to my house, right? The biggest, I guess, pain to it would just be the time, not necessarily the money, right? For most apartment complexes, the bigger problem is getting competent people to install the handicapped accessible stuff more so than getting the money to afford it, right? Um, a lot of apartment complexes will gladly take somebody with disabilities because they'll even get a stipend from the government for taking them and modifying their home to allow them to live in stuff, right? Now, let's say I, my apartment complex here has three stories. Let's say I'm, come, somebody comes in and the only apartment I have is upstairs, third floor, and my apartment complex here has concrete stairs going everywhere. And that person says, I can't do concrete stairs. You're going to have to move somebody out of a first floor apartment so I can have a first floor apartment. Is that a reasonable accommodation? No, right? That's not reasonable. What I can say is, what I'll do is put you on the list. And as soon as one of these apartments become available, I can contact you. But I can't kick somebody out just because you want a, no, a first floor apartment. This is what I have to offer. If you can't take that, then here's this. Here's what I can do to help you get up there. But I am not changing my, the whole structure of my apartment complex just because of you. Right? And that happens a lot, um, especially when you get those location, location, location apartments, right? You know, when you get those apartments that have that beautiful view or stuff like that, you know, people want those desirable apartments. And they'll say, well, you know, I want that apartment, so you're going to have to kick that person out because I'm disabled. Well, they don't have to. That's not a reasonable accommodation. Putting grab bars in showers, reasonable accommodation? Yeah, right? That's, that's, a, that's a, you know, a little bit of handiwork and some money, right? If you're a good homeowner, you've already done that. I did that with my house down in Tucson. I pretty much made every bathroom a handicap accessible bathroom. And I set them up so that if somebody would move into my, my house down there, that I can set up shower chairs and stuff like that. I thought in advance. And I got some grants and did some stuff that way. Um, now, the, my tenants that I have in Tucson are, have a 10-year lease with me, so I don't really have to worry about moving in handicapped accessible people. Um, he works for the military, and he's got 10 years at the base in Tucson. So they signed a 10-year lease with me, and I'm fantastic. I'm uh, perfectly okay with that. They're good peeps. Um, but yeah, if they need to make accommodations, I can. I will make accommodations within the Americans with Disabilities Act as long as it's reasonable. If it's not reasonable, what is the opposite of a reasonable accommodation? Do you remember that from... PTA 201. So you have reasonable accommodations or what if a handicapped person asks you to make changes and you know putting grab bars in the shower. The opposite of reasonable accommodation is an undue burden. An undue burden basically under the law is you know, that, that idea that I have to kick out a first floor apartment person for you. Now, what if I have a first floor apartment person that wants to move to a third floor for the view? Yep. Yes, I can. I can gladly spell that, Mr. So undo burden. Oh, they spelled accommodation wrong, I did. Thank gosh for a Google check. They'll spell it wrong. I saw, oh my God, I butchered this. Hold on here. There we go. 
Uh, if PT has a patient has a front wheel walker at home and they have steps, would you be? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, if there's one or two steps, I might even suggest putting in a small ramp as long as it doesn't interfere with other people's walkways. Just because it's a little easier to do the ramp. Um, but yeah, you could actually teach them more. What a lot of times what I'll do is I'll get them specific assistive devices for going up and down those few stairs, maybe like a pair of wall strands or something like that, or have them put up extra railings to go up and down the stairs. You know, have them put their walker up at the top stairs and go up the stairs and then go back to their walker. We definitely could. Um, the government also, the ADA also set, establishes requirements for telecommunication relay surfaces, right? Um, have you ever watched like an infomercial and at the end of the infomercial it says TTY? Have you ever seen that? Because the TTY, what, does anyone know what TTY stands for? So TTY is a device that allows, it's a touch tone, I forget the Y stands for off the top of my head. Um, but it allows, it's a relay service. So if you call in and you're deaf, right? Some of you I think are, Justin. Um, if you call in, you have a special device that'll display what the person's saying when they talk. Blind, not deaf, well, give a little bit of time. So you need Braille, that's what you need. Um, but it'll display what they're talking. So usually there's a relay between us. So if I was talking to somebody that's, you know, has a hearing impediment, what'll happen is I will say something, I have to say it. There's a relay between us that will translate what I say into text for the person. And that person can either respond to me via text, because sometimes that'll happen. So there's usually an operator between us. And they'll either respond via text, because a lot of times people with hearing impediments also have a little bit of a speech impediment or they'll respond normally to me. So I would say, you know, can I have your phone number? And the intermediary will type that and that'll appear on their phone and they can actually see what's going on. Um, AT&T has taken a lot of steps on this recently. That's some really cool technology that actually is coming out that's actually gonna allow it to appear on your cell phone. So right now that you have to have a special TTY app in order to get that type of uh, a relay going, but they're actually working on a technology that if I talk to you, it will translate as I'm talking to you, when I translate, it will type as I'm talking to you on their phone, which is actually really cool. Um, that's a huge jump forward. My downside thought to that is that gives the NSA the ability to listen to every phone call we have, but they already do that. So I mean, whatever. There's chat transcripts of, ev of everything you say everywhere. Um, interestingly enough, when we talk about that, that's also why, I don't know how many of you, how many of you guys have PlayStation 4s at home or Xboxes? I know a good bit of you, right? Um, how many of you guys use the chat feature where you're talking to somebody, where you use the headset and you talk to somebody else? The mic feature, yep. Did you know that every time you use that, your chat conversation is recorded and saved? It's recorded, saved, and typed out. <laughs> Chris is like, oh God, I love it. So why do you think they're doing that now? There's a couple of reasons. Number one, they started it, it should be sued. The bullying is exactly right, Elijah. That's 100% why they did it, right? Because if you bully somebody on chat now, there can be a record. Um, for those of you that don't know, are any of you into NASCAR in here? I, I, I may be the only redneck in here. I don't think anyone, WRC, okay. Well, NASCAR is a little different than NASCAR, yeah. So that's where they drive around and make left turns, right? Somebody got fired, this is exactly right. So one of the young and up and coming drivers who, um, you know, he's a really, really good driver. Um, there, I don't know how much you guys have seen of the racing world right now, but they're now doing iRacing where all the major drivers have these set up simulators in their home, which are just ridiculously expensive. Um, and this weekend during the race, um, he used, uh, yeah, he's half, but yes, he is Asian, he's half Japanese. Um, he used a term that was derogatory that he shouldn't have used in the middle of the race. He didn't cheat, no, 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 by far he did not cheat, no. Out loud, yes he did. 
out loud. And the best part was the reaction to everyone else in that. They're like, you realize you're on live chat. And somebody else goes, oh, boy. <laughs> um, so, you know, that, that chat's logged, too. So he ended up, he lost his sponsorship, and then he got us fired, and he's out of the sport, basically, right now. I mean, he's out. NASCAR said they are not necessarily going to let him back into the sport. Um, and the sad part is he was at the end of his contract with Chip Ganassi Racing. You shouldn't be laughing, right? At the end of his contract with Chip Ganassi Racing, he had this year to go. And he's such a good driver that next year he was looking to move to one of the major teams, like either a Hendricks team or a Penske team, which are the big name teams in NASCAR, and make mega bucks. He could have wrote his own check. Now he's out. They do go right. Thank you very much. Have you never seen road racing? But it's also the main reason is the setup. But anyway, that's the point. That gets way off topic. They're, they're doing environmental assessment because to make the track easier to go around. That's it. Well, NASCAR does have road racing, believe it or not. Anyway, they do. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of road races around. We are so off. Yes, we are. So I'm trying to get back. But that just shows there's a chat log of that. And two reasons are, number one, cyberbullying. Number two, for people that are deaf. Wow. Um, we're going to keep moving. Um, anyway. So yeah, so that's why they, they record those chats and also because of the NSA wants to hear you guys, but that's beside the point. Um, so concepts, how many of you guys look around town now and look at the houses and go, oh my God, all the houses look the same. Do you ever think that? Oh, more people are leaving. I guess they didn't like my comments. Yeah, it does, it looks all the same, why? Why does everything look the same? Okay, money, right? It's efficient, right? And the other thing is, is now that we've got, you know, again, where I'm from back in Pennsylvania, I'm not, I, I'm not joking with this. The stairs going up to my bedroom in my house, at, in my aunt's house at home, I'm not joking, we're two and a half feet wide. And they were like at a almost 90 degree angle, I would almost say, right? It is like Chicago. You're exactly right, Mike. Well, I mean, the, where I'm from is Wilkes-Barre, which really is like little Chicago, but that's beside the point. Um, but yeah, that, those type homes were made because there were no laws. Right? Exactly. Um, there are no laws. Well, now the main reason we have these cookie cutter houses is number one, it's easy to build them, right? They're very basic. They're very efficient. But the other thing is it's easy to adapt them for handicapped people. So it makes it easier on the builder. Um, now, you can perfectly get a custom house you want, right? Anywhere in town you hear you can pay for a custom house. It's just going to cost you a little bit of money, right? Or you can buy one of this stuff. It just allows for that kind of design of homes. There's a lot of communities springing up where the whole community is handicapped accessible or handicapped people. And that's because there's a lot of studies that show when you're in a community of people with disabilities like yourself, you see that you're not alone, right? There's also a ton of financial incentives for that, but that's beside the point. Um, so they're, you know, they're looking at how can we build these houses that are easiest to, you know, protect everybody and help make things. It allows products and environments to use by, by all people, right? Look at warehouses nowadays. You know, when I grew up, warehouses were these claustrophobic places where stuff was on the shelves that were ridiculously high to get to. Now, warehouses are mostly open floors design, right? They're big open floors is to get the machines down them as well. But it's also so that people that are handicapped can still work in warehouse houses. Um, I will say out of all the companies in town here, does anyone know what company in town hires the most handicapped people? They're really good about it. It's actually a local company. Zappos. Right, does everyone know what Zappos is? Everyone ever seen them? Yeah, shoes and whatever other crap they sell. Um, if you ever get a chance, if they ever, if they, I'll have to keep an eye out. They do tours on their building, um, which is up like their main buildings up near Old Town. Um, yeah, the pay isn't great, but their benefits are really amazing. Yeah, it's downtown, right? They have like a theater in their building. Everything's set up for, uh, for yeah, they party a lot. Yep. 
it's set up like the old school internet companies used to be set up. I'll just be honest. Um, when I came up through the internet, man, it was nothing for cake to have cake Friday. Um, they have mini golf coffee. Exactly. Right. But they are really big on making handicap accessible items. Um, they have this company right now. It's called Zappos Adaptive. And they're designing clothes, shoes, coats, everything like that for people on designs that are classic styles that you would see on high-end runways for people. Uh, why is why more homeless people after this? I don't know. Um, but the, for people that have disabilities, they're trying to make clothes that look like normal clothes. Because I don't know how much of you guys have seen clothes that are designed for people with handicaps, but the shoes aren't exactly cool, right? It's not like they make Air Force Ones in Velcro, right? They, they don't make diabetic Air Force Ones. The shoes that they make for people that have handicaps are often ugly and just ridiculously stupid. So they're trying to really adapt to it. Their CEO is really big about that. Um, I've met him twice now and it's, it's amazing his thought process behind it. And it was driven by some of his employees. You know, they saw the community and they said, how can we help out in the community? And they've done some amazing things. They do tours about it, tours of their facility quite frequently. So I have to keep an eye out and maybe we can offer extra credit when we're allowed to leave the house again, if we're ever allowed to leave the house again, right? Um, designs, initiated and development of the factory, a facility, not an after build, right? After build means we have an existing home. Let's we'll see if they do it. I don't know if they allow us into one of their parties. So the difference between the initial design or you know factory design versus after build. If they come into my apartment right now, my apartment complex that I live in was built in probably like the Stone Ages. Anything they have to add to my apartment here would be considered an after build. If they build a new home, they now have to do that at initial design. They have to change things for handicapped people, right? You know my apartment complex here when I had my ex-wife in a wheelchair, I asked to make my door bigger. They actually countered that and said that's an undue burden and they did not make my door bigger and they won because everything in my building is concrete. So that type of stuff is common. It includes the international symbols, right? We all know what a handicapped spot looks like, right? And we all know that we're not supposed to do what? Should we park in those spots? Right? Park there, exactly, right? You park in it, especially if you're only running in for a second, right? I'm only going in the store for a second. I can't tell you how many times I hear that. I, we have two main handicapped spots by our handicapped buildings here in my apartment complex. And people are always arguing with the tow company. I only parked there for a few seconds. I just needed to run into my house real quick. Park on the curb and turn your flashers on, right? Don't take up a spot that's needed by them. The other big thing and my biggest pet peeve, yeah, they really don't. I'll be honest about that. Yeah, I told you for a second, exactly. You want your car back, it's 130 now or 250 at the yard. I love hearing, because my, my window is facing, the, my office window is facing the handicapped spot. So I hear it all almost every day. 130 here, 250 at the yard. It's amazing how many people find 130 bucks. Um, but yeah, so one of the things that annoys me personally is beside the handicap, 300 plus now at the yard, oh, okay. Beside the handicap spot, there's this white lined area, right? Has everyone seen those? What's that white lined area designed for? That's extra space for people to park in case they need spaces, right? Yeah, it's for wheelchair ramps to get out of their cars. That's personally, I, as much as people park in handicap spots kind of gets my goat, that one gets me worse is when I see people kind of either do the two spot park across that white line area, or they think that's just extra area for them to park in so they're not so close to this car over here. That really annoys me when I see their wheels in that area. Those are designed specifically to the length of a normal wheelchair ramp. I, I have one, I have better than that. I'll have to see if I can find the one. I, what I do with people that I see that I actually have a little flyer that I put on their window. That's a picture of a turtle. And it says, here's a picture of a turtle so you can practice coloring inside the lines because obviously you don't know how to park in them. Um, but I might be a little passive aggressive. Uh, hold on a second. But I have, that's a great picture. I'll see if I can find it. It's a fantastic picture. But yeah, 
Parking those spots is actually illegal even, right? And it's not motorcycle parking either. That's the other thing that I see. It. I just trapped them with. That's kind of amusing too when you see it. I had a handicapped person do that the other day. With, uh, where, where, where was I at? I think it was at Target. He backed his van in right next to their driver's side door and got out the other side of the van. Um, that was amusing to me. That was totally worth watching. Because the guy had to get in through his hatch. That was fantastic. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the, the design that way, right? Um, there are all kinds of other type of signs as well, right? A few years ago, we had to put up the, you, you see that black restroom sign we have down by the restroom. I didn't realize we were in violation of law not having that sign up. Evidently, the guy that owned our building didn't realize that either, but we actually had some people come in for a, um, a continuing education conference. And one of the guys was one of these environmental assessors. And he's like, you guys don't have the signs up for your bathrooms. That's illegal. I never would have thought that putting a sign up that shows where the bathroom is actually is part of this kind of accessibility act. And you have to have that stuff up. The door to my office, not the one that you go in to visit me, but the door going outside from my office actually is illegal because it opens the wrong way. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have watched somebody going into Arc Point beside us, but to me, it's, that is like better than television because my doors push inward, not pull outward. Yeah, well, I'm going through. I'm going to fly through here, Russell. Anyway, you have four hours with me. Suck it up. Uh, accessible design, structures that meet prescribed accessible. Oh, I went too fast. So why do we do assessments? Well, to assess the safety. That's the main thing. Then also to make realistic, uh, realistic recommendations. We also may have to assess the patient's need for adaptive equipment and preparing the patient support network, determine if further services are needed. Now, we may need to indicate that they not only need, you know, ramp getting in their house, but they need additional medical care or help getting in and out of their house. So we have to pay attention to that. So how do we assess the environment? Interviews, number one. First of all, we have to interview the patient. So we sit down with the patient, discuss with them, what do they see as barriers to them going home, right? And then we're going to have them perform the performance assessment based test, basically asking it gives them a little uh, kind of look out of, I have trouble doing this every day. I have trouble doing that every day. And then we go to their place and we actually look at their physical space, right? Usually we'll take a, a what do you call it, a blueprint, look at the way it's laid out, and then go to their on-site visit and see what's going to cause a problem with that patient. There's a lot of stuff in homes that cause problems to patients, not including those little rat dogs. So how do we play into this? Well, let's be honest. PTs don't have time to do this. They don't, right? They just don't have time to do this. Is this making an evaluative criteria on the patient's home? So would this be considered an evaluation? You would think in a way it would, right? But this is the way we get, home health companies do do this, as well as um, even inpatient hospitals have PTs and PTAs that are trained to go do this before they release somebody. So both, I know Summerlin does it quite a bit. Uh, Summerlin will has, have some of their PTs sometimes go home to assess the patient before, you know, before they send them home to make sure they're safe, right? Because if it's not safe to go home, they can make some money, bring them over into the rehab department and money's always good. Um, but yeah, so the, it, the way we get around this and why PTAs are able to do this is we go and just state the way the building is, right? It's very much like manual muscle testing, right? If we assess somebody's manual or, you know, biceps, all we're going to do is give the flat number, right? They're a four out of five. We don't say why they're a four out of five. We just say they're a four out of five. So we go and do the assessment of what we see as barriers, concerns, areas to be fixed and stuff like that. And then we'll turn that assessment over to the PT or more importantly, oftentimes to a caseworker. And then that caseworker will make the evaluation on what the patient needs. And that's kind of how we get around the ability to do this. We can do this. This is 100% of PTA responsibility. And again, like I said, if you ask most PTs, they don't like doing this. There's two reasons they don't like doing this. Number one, they don't have time, right? I don't know how much you guys have seen of recent evals that PTs are doing, but they just don't have time to do this kind of stuff. Um, the eval required for a home health 
yeah, two visits with notes. The eval required for a home health assessment uh, usually takes a PT about an hour to type up. And they don't get paid for that most times, right? That's what the rate's covering. And then for this, they're not gonna get paid for this. They're, I mean, the money is not that great to do these home assessments. So it's not like you're gonna make $50,000 extra year to do this. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they have to sign up. They still have to co-sign anything we do. Absolutely, anything that we do, we have to have a PT that's co-signing. Doesn't matter if it's an environmental assessment. The nice part about this is they don't have to do an evaluation before we go see their home. Because we're not assessing the patient, we're assessing the home. Stop text messaging me. Oh, Justin's computer just restarted itself. He'll be right back. He probably didn't check for Windows updates before we started. I'm just saying. Um, but yeah, they, they have to approve. So they just have to co-sign our notes. They don't necessarily have to. And honestly, when I'm in home health and I've done this, the PT rarely even looks at this. They just assume that I can tell what a barrier is. And then that gets to the case manager so we can get them the appropriate equipment. Um, so it's not really like they have to co-sign as much as they would a regular note. And some of the PTs, when they co-sign notes, really read your notes. So I'm just warning you. Um, things we can do, assistive devices, right? All our types of assistive devices. Parallel bars are a possibility. Um, I've actually had a patient where we put parallel bars in their, ha their hallway. So along either side of the hallway, so they could go back because the hallway was too narrow to put a walker in or to put assist devices in, but we could do the two parallel bars and allow them to walk back the hallway on their own again. Um, any safety devices, right? This includes stuff like leg lifters, um, grabbers, anything to that effect, um, like tables that you can, or not tables, but trays that you can mount on their, their assistive devices, stuff like that to help them. Any structural alterations. With structural alterations, the main thing we wanna look at is, is it altering a, retaining a retention wall or is it just altering a non-weight bearing wall? So if we say that they have to open up a doorway because the doorway is too narrow, we have to know is that a weight bearing structural wall or is it not? And the only way we're going to know that is by looking at the blueprints. Right? So you do have to be a little bit technical and when you're doing this you will get trained on this. This isn't like they're just going to throw you and go do this. You're going to get trained on looking on blueprints as to what's a structural wall and what's not a structural wall. The main idea in most homes around the area is you can tell a structural wall versus a non-structural wall based upon the sound when you knock on it, right? If it's a non-structural wall, most times you knock on it and it's hollow sounding, right? It's because there's not a lot of framework behind it. Um, any modifications to the environment, right? Oh, well, that's what my brother told me. He does a lot. Look at the doorways and structures. Yep, exactly. And you can make decent money doing it. That's the nice part. Um, modifications, altering environmental objects. You know, if you come to a patient's home and their bed is up here, right? Well, we might have to tell them that bed's too high, right? Or I've had patients where literally their bed doesn't have a bed frame. Uh, let me answer that in a second. Uh, you know, maybe they don't have a bed frame. So we have to talk to them about getting a bed frame because getting up off the floor is a kind of a pain in the butt for patients that maybe are handicapped now. And then anyway, we can mask or task modify so make things a little bit easier for them. As far as how many could you see in a normal day, it depends. Because most of the times that I, if, when I've done these, this wasn't the only thing I'm doing. Um, these are adjunctive to seeing patients. So a lot of times when I, when I get asked to do a, a, a home health assessment, I'm just taking for extra money. It's not like I'm going to see that patient long term. But literally, I mean, you can do an assessment in probably 30 to 45 minutes. So as many as you would take in that day if the home health agency had it. I mean, whatever they want to give you. There's not something where they specifically set. And when I talk about home health, I'll talk about the way that you're kind of paid in home health. It's a little different than being paid in the clinic. It uh, also depends on how far they are from each other, right? Yeah. I, you know, I, one of the reasons I get paid so well is I see patients literally everywhere. They tell me they've got a patient up in Moapa. Guess what? I'm going to Moapa. I'm okay with it. Um, a lot of PTs don't like to do that, and PTAs don't like to do that. So it just depends. You know, if I have a patient that's, I'm doing an environmental assessment out by Lake Las Vegas, and my next patient's out in Red Rock. Uh, yeah, it's pay by visit. Yep, you're exactly right, Melissa. You get paid by visit for these types. And again, you have to find the right agency to do it too. That's the major problem you find with this. And right now there's not a lot of agencies doing anything. 
Um, need to know what the patient's current functional level is. How are we going to know what their current functional level is? What are we going to look at? Eval on the chart, right? Yeah. We're going to have to look at their eval on chart and figure out where they're at. Um, we need to know their potential for further gains, right? If we have a spinal cord injury patient, we know that's a complete spinal cord injury. We pretty much know there's not going to be a lot of gains after that first year. So we need to make sure that we get everything done. You know, what their future plans are, insurance info, anything, what's the insurance going to cover? A lot of times we've got to work with our social workers or our case, I'm sorry, case management to find out what the insurance is going to cover for this patient. A lot of times health insurance will help cover some of the costs of modifications because it's better for them to pay for modifications to a house than it is for them to, you know, pay for a patient to fall at home. Um, are they planning on staying in these homes for a long period of time? That'll determine whether we put in full-time equipment or just you know, temporary equipment. Uh, rehab team needs to have good understanding of current assistive devices and adaptive equipment. So this is thing, when you're doing this type of stuff on a regular, I'll be honest, I'm a little rusty at this now because I haven't done one in a little while. Um, but when you're doing this, you have to be constantly up on it. You have to be going to the trade shows where they're talking about adaptive equipment. I love, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a geek. I actually like going to those home builder shows and stuff like that because I like looking at homes I can't afford. And also because they usually have a lot of neat stuff on adaptive equipment. So there's some great stuff on there as well that you can watch through. Uh, best done by interdisciplinary approach. I oftentimes, I like it if I've got an OTA or an OT that's going with me to it because they look at things a little differently than I do. They try to figure out how easy it is to play board games. I, oh wait, no, I mean, that's not what all they do. They, are, they do get trained a little differently than us. They tend to look at things a little bit more from a psychological perspective. You know, how is this going to affect the patient's psyche? We have to look at patient's needs, right? In this area, what medical conditions specifically during summer could be a concern for the climate of the home? MS, exactly, right? So why do so many MS patients move here? Because we do have a high, we have a pretty large community of MS patients in this town. Okay, the heat, right? So here's the, this is the, 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 the this dichotomy. And same reason, you know, my ex-wife was autoimmune, same reason we moved here. The heat is fantastic for them to be able to move around, right? When you're warmer, your joints are a little bit more mobile. The bursas are a little bit more, you know, pliable. It allows you to move a lot better and it reduces your overall pain that way. The downside is, heat can also cause you to flare if you're an MS patient, right? The same thing with my ex-wife. The heat could often cause her to have many heat exhaustions or heat strokes when we're out in it. So it's a delicate balance of those patients. Whereas in cold weather, if you've got these conditions, a lot of times you're stiff, you're sore, you're achy, and they're not able to do as much. So it's a really delicate balance. So especially on patients that have, you know, MS or heat intolerance, we definitely want to make sure that their air conditioners are functional, right? And a lot of times for that, I'm going to have to get somebody else to come out and look at it. I don't, I can't fix an air conditioner. I don't know what I'm looking at. I open it up and go, yep, there are wires, right? So we may have to have an electrician or an HVAC tech come out and make sure that their, you know, their climate control system is functional. But also let's think about it. So I know that my climate control switch is about six feet off the ground. What if I was in a wheelchair? Would that do me any good? Well, I guess you're saying whatever temperature it stayed at, right? It's gonna be 72 in the house forever. So they may ha we may have to adjust and we, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, that's great, exactly. There's a lot of stuff now that we didn't have before. We could move it down, right? That's, a, that's the old school version, we'll just move it down. You could, right? But the new school version now is you can get exactly. You can go, hey, Google, and Google will adjust your temperatures for you, right? You get a Nest or something to that effect. There's a lot of new stuff that has really helped out the handicap community. Just think about it. For example, like the um, either Simply Safe or the Ring door alarms, right? If I'm confined to a wheelchair, and then your battery's right now. <laughs> Hopefully you have a lot of charge. If I'm confined to a wheelchair, is it easy for me to get up, open the door, and let a delivery person in? Probably not, right? So maybe I transferred out of my wheelchair and I'm now sitting on the couch and I order pizza. 
I'd have to transfer myself back to my chair, roll all the way over the door, open the door and let them in. Now with things like the, the ring systems and you know, the Simply Safes, you can actually open the door and I don't know why, I'm still a little leery of letting a piece of people come into my house, but you theoretically could. You can un unlock the door and have them come in. I love that commercial where the guy lets the pizza person in while he's up in the bathtub, that's fantastic. That's not asking for your wallet to get stolen. Um, but yeah, so you can allow, you know, or if I have to let my nurse or my caregiver in, I can now let my caregiver in with an app as long as your battery is good, right? Make sure you got some solar power and solar backup. Um, we have to look at the interior and the exterior of the home. Don't just look at the exterior. Don't just look at the interior. You've got to look at it and combine, right? You also have to look at it from the patient's perspective. I've had PTs and PTAs that have done this assessment and they go look at the patient's garage and they're like, this garage is fantastic. It works well. You know, and there's plenty of room. Well, there's plenty of room for a patient that has, you know, a Corolla. But now the patient is going to be moving to a wheelchair van with a ramp, and there's no room to get the ramp out. So now that garage is useless to the patient, right? So we have to assess it on what their needs are going to be, not what their needs were. Um, there's all kinds of home evaluations. The main thing is looking at assessment to the home. The other thing that we have to look at is an evacuation plan. How many of you guys have an evacuation plan? Especially parents. Good, Jenna? Nope. Okay, Melissa, good. Run faster than everyone else. Don't have, <laughs> have no shit plan, exactly. Oh, I've got bug out bags and everything ready, but that's side the point, right? But especially families, like, you know, I'm looking at you, Jack, and I'm looking at Melissa, great job, right? You've got to not only have that evacuation plan, but do your kids know the evacuation plan? Do they understand? Do you run drills with them like you would, we would run drills at Pima? Just curious. Not yet? Okay. You can't be faster than the next guy, right? It's, it's the old theory because, you know, I'm an old tabletop role play game guy because I love playing D&D &D and stuff like that. I, my line was, I never have to run faster than the dragon. I just have to run faster than you. Right? When you're running after a rule number, is that rule number three, cardio? Or is it rule number one? I thought rule number one was double tap. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway. Yeah, so you have to, you had to use it a few times. So that was practice. Good job. Well, not good job that you had to use it, but good job that you've run it, right? That's why it's kind of funny. I know that we take it kind of silly and stuff like that when we do our lockdown drills and do our fire drills. But you guys would think, you would think that, if we have a fire that, you know, it's going to be, you guys are going to be running around with your hair cut off and ah, screaming, but usually you're going to go into the training that you've already done. You guys are going to go out the doors, you're going to get over to main campus, and you'll be, you're now kind of trained and conditioned to do that. Same thing needs to be for your home assessment. We need to have them have an exit plan. You know, what happens if there's an earthquake and their front door is blocked? Right? How does a handicapped person get out of their house? Is there a window that is designed to be a pop-out window? Those are the things we have to think about. And what happens like me that I don't have a back door? I have a screen door going, yeah, I'm out of luck, right? I have a screen door going out to my enclosed porch that doesn't have a door going out of the enclosed porch. I'm in trouble, right? I better like Superman it right out a window. It's so when critical thinking will be useful. And the problem with critical thinking at that point, Alex, is when you're in an emergency situation, guess what happens to your critical thinking? It's not working. Yep, it's gone. Right? That's why we train these things, right? It may even be beneficial to recommend an exit plan and then run it through with the patient. Right? You've got to make sure they understand how. It, don't just give them, here's my excellent exit plan for you in case you have a fire. Run it through it with them. See how long it takes them, right? I do that a lot of times with patients that are, yeah, deep breathing will help. You're right. But when you've got smoke all around you, deep breathing is not always a good thing. Push out the door. Um, but, you know, where was I going with this? I totally, geez, Alex, maybe lose my train of thought there a little bit. Um, but make sure you go over it with your patient, right? One of the things I do with my patients if they're a community ambulator in a wheelchair <clears throat> is if there's someplace at home, I can set up an area for them to practice crossing the road. I do that because here in Nevada, if you can't get across that road quick, you're road pizza. That's just the way it is. So you, even if you can get across the road quick, there's a good chance you're going to be road pizza. 
Um, primary door and hall widths, we need to know the, the hall widths need to be wide enough to move a wheelchair through, right? And then floor surface, is it a hardwood floor? Is it deep carpet? Um, toilet and shower access, right? What happens if a patient's got one of those super deep, you know, garden tubs, you know, that's so fantastic for soaking in, and now they can't get in and out of it, right? Time to call that company that's on the TV all the time showing the stand-up showers, right? Um, these are the things you have to think of with these patients. Their bed height we talked about already, kitchen accessibility. Um, I saw one patient once that I was, and this wasn't a home health assessment, this was just a patient I saw, on the wall above, or on the one wall in their kitchen, they had one of those knife racks, you know, ones where the knives are stuck up magnetically to it. And the patient was confined to a wheelchair, so they had to lean way forward to reach up to grab one of those knives. And I just kept thinking, what happens if he reaches up for it and doesn't quite get it, and the knife comes down to their forehead, right? I'm like, why don't we move down to a butcher block for the time being until you can stand again? <laughs> Probably a little bit safer. Um, phone and light switch accessibility. How many of you guys still have a hard phone in your house? And when I say hard phone, I'm not talking one from Comcast because that doesn't count. One from, you know, either Verizon that's actually a physical phone line. Does anyone still have those? Yeah, landline, true landline though. Okay, Mike still has one. Elijah has one, great. Now Elijah, and I'm gonna ask this, Nothing's attached, exactly. Um, with that landline, is that landline attached to your cable modem? Because a lot of them are nowadays. Yeah, so that's not a landline anymore. Right, so here's the deal. This is something people don't think of a lot of times, and it's something that we kind of have to think of nowadays. Right, so some of you are saying no, so you're good off, right? But in my case, I don't have a landline, period. I don't even have a cable voice over IP line. They're basically for the security gate. <laughs> At least you've got one going out. Um, if the land if your cable goes out because of some whatever reason, maybe a tree goes down and knocks through the cable lines, you're losing not only your TV, internet and phone as well. So now you have nothing, you better have a cell phone. Right? And you better hope that cell phone's not overloaded. Um, I, when I went down to do Hurricane Katrina relief way back when that stuff happened, which wasn't that long ago, but it's history for some of you guys. That was the major problem we ran into was people were starting at that point to start convert over to voice over IP, which is what those internet phones that your cable company provides you like Cox or Comcast or Xfinity or any of those. Um, so, you know, a lot of times those lines, once the stuff goes down, once the cable's down, you're done. And then they think they're going to rely on their cell phone. Well, in the case of Hurricane Katrina, everyone's trying to rely on their cell phone. So guess what happened to the cell phone? dead All right new year's on the strip exactly or the first day that we went into lockdown how many of you people had problems with your internet the first day we went on lockdown did anyone notice your internet well even now the internet sucks right i'd say it i miss getting full gig blast speeds i don't get that anymore because we have so many people using the internet at this point so why cox should have paid attention but they didn't anyway beside the point so that's the stuff we have to pay attention to, right? We may have to look at getting them an emergency alert system that operates on a different band, right? Maybe a radio band or something to that effect. These are the things we have to think about. Light switches. Again, the good news is now we can put in electronic light switches and they can adjust everything right on their phone, right? We have come a long ways, but you may need to adjust the light switch height. Uh, it's growing industry. Right now, therapists need to review catalogs, do internet searches. And a lot of times, if you're interested in doing this, and honestly, if you're thinking, hey, this sounds pretty cool, this is open to start a business, and I hate to say it. I, 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 you know, this is something you could design. There's not a specific company in town right now that does this. So this is a burgeoning market that you literally could tap into here and probably make a good bit of money. I'm just saying, I, I, there's not, I mean, home health agencies offer it, but there's not a specific company that all the hospitals can come to and do, that's the only thing your company specializes in is going in and doing home health assess or home assessments and giving them objective feedback. Um, it's all on who's trained to do it and who's not trained to do it. So I'm just saying, uh, creativity is essential, right? We may not always have to use the most expensive method to help a patient. 
Uh, workplace assessment. What is workplace assessment known as? What do we call that in PT? Does anyone know? There's a specific term for it. Okay, FCC, FCE is one of them, yep. ERGs, right? And then the other one is just common work hardening. Right, have you guys heard that term before? That's the, that's the actual, um, uh, the silo in the APTA that kind of falls under is the work hardening silo. Even though it may be workplace assessment and it may be uh, injury recovery, that's kind of the silo they put it under is work, work hardening, right? It's a similar assessment to the home health assessment, but we're instead we're going into a company now to do assessments. Uh, I will give it this, culinary does really good job, really good work with this, right? The culinary union is really, I mean, they may have other problems, but they're really good about trying to make sure that people that work in the casinos and that have most of the stuff they need. Um, they're pretty good advocates when you know how to get them moving, right? But we may have to look at the workplace assessment and how to change things, right? We may have to look at their eye hand coordination, functional reach, all that. Um, I always look at like the dealers. Has anyone ever actually sat and watched a dealer at a casino and just thought how bad like their body mechanics have to be doing this, right? Most of the time the tables are below hip level and so they're constantly bending over, right? It's rigged. Yeah, so good. Yeah, Jack, I'm sorry to hear that. But yeah, I mean, and let's, and let's face it, for those of you that, and this is going to be one, my pedestal here real quick, for those of you that aren't behind this, every single one of you in physical therapy should be behind getting smoking out of the casinos. It's not going to affect business. People are still going to go to the casinos. People are still addicted but we really should get smoking out of the casinos because all we're doing is creating people with secondhand cancer. Yeah, making a smoke room is one thing, right? That's, but then you have to also make sure the, pay, the, the person that's going into that room to work understands the health risks of working in there and they need to be compensated appropriately. That's the other, some of the casinos I've seen do that and they don't tell the people, oh, you're more likely to die by working in this room filled with smoke. Um, but yeah, so it's, you know, in general, like I, I've watched, you know, especially, you know, servers and stuff like that in the casinos so when they're walking around in, you know, 12 inch spike heels. I just think to myself, God, have we not progressed now to know that's not good. Right. And culinary helps a lot with that. I will give it, but yeah. I just like, I hate smoke. I, that, I can't tell you the last time I actually was down in a casino. Um, oh, I think I went down when the Cosmopolitan had the fire up in the uh, pool because I wanted to go see what it looked like. Because I was, yeah, right? These are the things. We don't think about these things here. We have a unique work environment here. We very, very, very much have a unique work environment here. It's in a couple other places in the world but it's really unique because we have a normal community of employees, right? We have people that do mail delivery. We have people that work retail, but we have a lot of employees of casinos, right? And not only casinos, but adjunct as well. So people that do, you know, maintenance in the buildings, people that do the housekeeping, people do this. There's a lot of stuff. Even the executives a lot of time don't always have the best, you know, environmental work area, even though it's, we feel really sad for them. Um, we may have to look at what we need to do. If you're doing serving on the strip, do you have to have pretty good cardiopulmonary function? What do you think? Yeah, if you want to make money, right, you've got to have some pretty good cardiopulmonary function, right, especially when running around the casino floor delivering stuff. So then why do we allow smoking there? Because think about it, as you're sucking in and getting your cardiopulmonary function, you're actually sucking in twice as much smoke as maybe the person's actually smoking. But anyway, so there are all kinds of assessment tools here. Therapists will need to do a job analysis, right? And when I say therapist, I know that Dr. Reskin has a problem with using therapists as a PTA. Um, and again, this is where, yeah, so I'm sorry if they don't. This is where different, differing views happen. I know there are PTAs out there that have a problem with PTA or PTs out there that have a problem with calling PTAs therapists. 
your title is physical therapist assistant, therefore you are a therapist. Her and I have had a discussion about it, and this is just one of those ones where we agree to disagree, right? And I can understand where the, where the PT would come across as this because we don't have a DPT, but I'm not saying I have a DPT. A therapist is somebody that treats a patient. That's the way I look at it. I treat patients, right? But we need to do this job assessment. We have to know what they're doing. How many of you guys know exactly what a, you know, a pit boss does? Okay, some of you are going to say, yeah, right? Stand there. There's more to it than that, but yeah, right? There are things that pit bosses do, but if you don't know what they do, how are you going to find out what they do in order to do a job assessment? Yeah, shadow. Exactly. A lot of times when people that do these workplace assessments, they're going to follow you around all day long and see what you do on a daily basis and then provide you with feedback on how to improve your overall function. This can be really fun. We may have to do ergonomic assessments, checking what their immediate risks are for physical, physical injury to the musculoskeletal system, right? Maybe again, we go back to that blackjack dealer and the tables below their ASIS. So every time they're picking cards up, what are they gonna have to do? So every time they clear the table, they've gotta bend over, right? Is that gonna affect their back? Yeah, absolutely, right? So we may have to talk and figure out how can we get either that up or get them lower? Um, I've seen a, a couple of the casinos back where I'm from, because we do have some casinos back where I'm from. Usually the floor where the dealers and the pit bosses stand is actually below the people that are on the floor. So there's a slight discrepancy, usually about a foot discrepancy. And that's mainly to help with ergonomics, right? But there's also some psychology behind it as well. They won't tell you this. But if your dealer is smaller than you are, you feel more empowered to bet because you're probably going to beat them because there's a psychological thing about being bigger than somebody. So, but that's beside the point. That's why all the chairs are usually high at those casinos. Um, there's, there is psychological. There is money. Yeah, there's money there. So we may have to look at transportation issues. Do we have a fairly robust transportation system here in Vegas? What do you think? So I'm not fooling anyone. Well, yeah, you may be the ideal dealer, though. You might just think of it that way. Kind of, right? Yeah, I mean, not if they lower the floors. <laughs> I can't see over the table. Um, anyway, so yeah, we have a fairly robust transportation system here in town. Comparatively to where I'm from, where in the whole area I'm from, now we have a couple cities. We have York, Pennsylvania. Right? We have Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We, you know, we have a couple other little towns. Each of those towns has a separate transportation system. We do need a better routes and train system. I think the train system would solve a lot of it, Alex. I will 100% agree with you. Or at least a tram system or a better monorail system. Right? But we have a pretty functioning bus system. It is now, yes. It didn't used to be. And the main reason we can consider Uber public transportation now is because a lot of insurance companies are starting to cover it, especially for healthcare visits and stuff like that. Um, I wouldn't consider taxis public transportation system. I consider them more holding you hostage, but you know, they do serve a purpose as well. Uh, use of electric wheelchair or scooter, right? If we want to put them in something to die in order to get a wheelchair and a scooter, excuse me, patient must be currently using a walker, and a manual wheelchair and be unable to function with one of these. How many of you have seen the ads on television? I got my free rascal. We'll help you get your free power wheelchair. Just contact us now, right? A lot of times those companies were gonna lie to Medicare. And what they don't tell you is they won't get it approved, but they'll make you sign a contract saying they're gonna get it for you. And then you end up having to pay anyway, right? So they have to have all these, they have to have severe upper extremity weakness, there has to be a list of certain medical conditions like COPD and stuff like that. The, pay, the doctor has to do an assessment saying the patient needs a current electric wheelchair. And we have to have done an assessment of home showing that that electric wheelchair will function in their home. And not only the electric wheelchairs, but the scooters. What's the difference between a scooter and an electric wheelchair? Does anyone know?
Like the rascals, yeah, the drive component, right? And scooters usually have steering of some sort and the distance they can go, right? Use an electric wheelchair, will run all day, but you don't have a far distance you can go. It's not like you could use that to go down, you know, where I'm from about a mile from the strip, you couldn't necessarily use an electric wheelchair to get all the way down to the strip. It would probably die before you get down there. But scooters are usually designed to go a little further, right? And now we're talking to scooter, we're not talking to scooters that are driving around town um, and running over people. Yeah, they are. Um, any of those type of vehicles can be trouble, right? I mean, and think about it, even though we have these, um, I'm gonna link you to, I showed you guys the um, Zach, oh God, I can't think of that guy's name, but he does the, um, the CP videos. He's one of the spokesperson for the, the CP foundation. I showed you the, his video about being diagnosed with CP, right? Where he talked about nothing's wrong with my body, it's my brain that's broken. Um, he did a great video where he went around New York City and then he did one in San Francisco showing how handicap accessible they are. The New York City one's hilarious. I'll post a video for it. It's just phenomenal. He's going to get a rainbow bagel. And yeah, the bagel thing, it's, it's fantastic. Like just to see how much he has, not fantastic as in like, oh my God, this is an awesome movie, but fantastic to see how unaccessible the city actually is. He ends up taking like, I think almost four hours to go like five miles because that's the way he had to go because he was handicapped. So it's really interesting when you look at what those patients have to go through. Social services, I really need to change that because we're getting away from calling them social services. They're now case management or case managers. Um, can help with funding, right? Varies by community and state. Many disease categories have their own network, right? If you have CP, there's a CP network. If you have a spinal cord injury, there's a spinal cord injury network. There's networks out there for everything. Oftentimes what we act as in the PT community is the liaison between them and getting into one of those communities, right? There's not an initiation ritual to get into the spinal cord injury community other than you have to have a spinal cord injury. It's not like they haze you, right? But they may not know how to get in touch with those people. So we have to kind of act as that liaison. I have a lot of contacts in the pediatric community. I don't have as many in the adult community, right? So if I was going into that adult community, I need to start reaching out and putting my you know, tendrils out and trying to get some contacts all over the place. The best way to do that is going to socials where they're talking, where the community has a social event, right? Or where they're doing donations and going to those events and rubbing elbows and talking with people. This can be the downside because some of you, I know probably aren't interested in doing PR, right? I'm assuming that's probably not what your interest is when you're getting into PT. But in order to get some contacts in the field, you're going to have to do a little bit. Of it. You have to rub some elbows with some people. You're going to have to play golf, maybe, which I can't play. I'm horrible, really horrible. I mean, just horrible. But I will go play golf and pretend like I'm hitting the white ball and chasing it if I can get some new contacts, right? I get a lot of contacts in the medical field, like doctors and stuff like that, by playing golf and letting them take my money. Uh, other organizations, National Council on Disabilities, the VA Housing Grants, Division of Voc Rehab. Has anyone ever dealt with Voc Rehab? Has anyone had somebody that deals with Voc Rehab? No? Anyone know what Voc Rehab's job is? Bueller? Okay, thank you. At least we'll make sure that you guys are still awake. Thank you, Elijah. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> Voc, Voc is vocational rehabilitation. So what is, yeah, occupation, exactly. So for example, I'm going to use myself as an example. When I broke my neck, one of the caveats to me getting through all the process with workers' comp is I had to see a vocational rehabilitation specialist. What they do is they help determine, based upon the medical input, and what you get on the, you know, what you're actually functioning at, if you can return to your own job, right? Now, do you think there are some pretty steep requirements to return to physical therapy? Like, do you think it's just, oh, you know, I broke my neck and I could just right, get right back into it? No, there are some steep requirements. You're just like the requirements we tell you, the patient lifting and everything like that. I still don't trust myself 100% with patient lifting. That's why I tend to work still more with pediatrics and, you know, I'm not going to lift a 700 pound patient anymore. I've learned my lesson. Um, 
but yeah, so Voc Rehab can help in that case. And a lot of times with workers comp, Voc Rehab can help you pay to get reeducated in another field, right? So there is money in vocational rehabilitation for people on workers comp. I chose not to take vocational rehab because I just, they can also help you find a job, right? I chose not to take it and I just took the payout on it because I figured that I could rehabilitate myself and get myself back to work. Hey, I actually did. In the end, I didn't need to go back 100% to work because I found a great job working with a group of people that want to learn about physical therapy, right? And that just are just sponges for learning. So vacation, it depends. So there's a couple different types of voc rehab therapists. There are PTs and PTAs in voc rehab. Um, trying to think Genesis is the company here in town that handles most of voc rehab. I don't know if you guys have heard of them before. But Genesis is the major vocational rehab company here in our town. There's a couple of them. Health South handles it a lot on the East Coast. Um, but there's a couple companies that do this. There are going to be vocational rehab, PTs, OTs, speech, everything like that. And then there's just going to be the voc rehab counselors. And most of the time, to become a counselor, you have to have a degree in the allied health field. And the one I saw was just, um, she had her degree in nursing and she was retired from nursing. That's what she came to talk to me about and figure out how to get me through it. Um, that's the main thing you have to have. You have set to some sort of healthcare degree. A lot of them usually will try to get their master's in healthcare administration because that looks really good. And for those that aren't, you know, don't want to go for your DPT and want a higher degree, I would highly recommend the MHA. The MHA is a really good degree to help open doors for you in the field if you want to go on for further degrees. Um, I will warn you if you want to go for your MHA, it's a lot of work. Uh, workers' Compensation Commission. What do the Workers' Compensation Commission help? Why do we have to found a Workers' Comp Commission? Why do you think we had to find, create this division? Why do we have to create these weird things that regulate that employers will pay employees if they're hurt on the job? Well, people faking injuries, one. Okay, good. Yeah, they're kind of, they kind of, they kind of handle a union where we don't have a union. You're exactly right, Ashley. So for example, the company I worked at didn't have a union. There was no unionized thing. So the Workers' Compensation Commission helped keep me protected so that my company didn't try to do illegal things with me because companies will, right? They're trying to cut their bottom line and save as much money as possible. And if they can do it by just firing you outright, you got injured on the job, you're fired. That's not right. You can't do that. That's why there are all these companies that help with this, right? They also help protect employers from malingerers, right? For people that are lying, still injured, or at least they try to. Um, there's civic groups. Mason, Shriners, and Lions Club are really good organizations for people that are injured. Um, the Freemasons are not, you know, out there to rule the world, and they're not the Illuminati, but um, they do exist out there. Various church organizations also help out the people. So here's those main acts, right? We have the Americans Disability Act, guaranteed civil rights protection. We're talking about public place accommodation. The main thing with, one of the other things, 80, 32nd degree, nice. Uh, I'm a second degree, but it's black belt. So anyway, um, the main thing, one of the neat things that the ADA actually gave us is the ability for national parks to have people that are handicapped be able to get in them, right? Because a lot of our national parks were not exactly handicapped accessible. They're not. And so they had to make adjustments so that people that were less able than normal able people could actually still visit the Grand Canyon, you know, could visit the, um, the petroglyphs up in Red Rock, all that type of stuff. Now, it doesn't mean that they have to carve out the canyons and make them be able to go up and down the canyons but they have to have access to the general national parks. Fair Housing Act, we talked about already, prohibits discrimination in housing. The Rehabilitation Act of 1973, right? Access must be provided to all federally funded buildings. So any building that is either local, state, or federal municipality owned have to have complete handicap accessibility. I think it's kind of funny that we had to make a law about this because to me, that just seems like common sense, right? If you're going to the DMV and you're in a wheelchair, they should have wheelchair accessibility. I mean, I, I don't consider that rocket science. Does anyone else consider that rocket science? But we had to create a law that said that. And that's kind of, that kind of says a lot about our culture, doesn't it? I'm just saying, 
even this, this current pandemic has shown me a lot about our culture. Architectural Barrier Acts of 1968, building finance with federal funds need to be designed, and then Public Buildings Act of 1983 made amendments to it, strengthened and delineating the importance of accessibility. So this is where we started coming up with what those reasonable accommodations are and those undue burdens. Ramps, do you remember this? The one-to-one -one ratio, right? So what does that mean? What does the one to 12 or the one to one ratio mean? Let's see if you remember this. When calculating ramps, rise over run, good. Yeah, so for every, is it one foot? For every one inch of rise, you have to have one foot. I knew some people would cough on people. I absolutely believe that, yeah, anyway. So here's the deal. In areas that have snow and ice, it can be one to 20. So like where I'm from, they can be up to one to 20, but we still don't like to do that because that's a, still a pretty steep angle. Um, that's at about a 47 degree angle most of the times when you're looking at it, and that's pretty steep. So one to 12 or one to one, you know, one to 12 is what a lot of times you're gonna see. Um, but in PT books, we usually say one inch, for every one inch you go up, you need one foot of run, so one to one. You need to know that for your boards because your boards are gonna ask you questions where you do have to do math and you do not get a calculator, okay? So the rise should not exceed 30 inches. So if you have 30 inches of height, that's the length. How long is your, your ramp gonna be? So 30 inches is right there. If you have 30 inches of height, 30 inches of height, so how long of a ramp? 30 feet, right. Now at that 30 feet part, it cannot be longer than that. Yes, exactly. There has to be what's called a switchback of every 30 feet. So switchback is a flattened off platform where a wheelchair can make a turn and go up an additional 30 feet. So let's say that your, your house is 60 inches to get in. You're essentially gonna have to have 30 foot ramp going down, switch back, and a 30 foot ramp going down. Right, it has to have that flat platform. Why do they need that platform? There's a couple reasons. Take a break is one of them, yep. Space to maneuver, good. But let's also think about it. Let's say, yeah, there it is right there. Good job, Jenna. Let's think about this for a second. You have 60 feet of a ramp going downhill at about a you know, 35 degree angle. Instead, you know, instead of having a 30 foot ramp, now it's a 30 by 30 ramp, you now have 60 feet. And you're weak and you start pushing up that. You get about three quarters of the way up that ramp and you're tired, which way are you going? Right back down the ramp, right? So it's a slow down and help with that momentum, right? It helps them to have to not roll backwards this far. Um, there has to be a certain size of that ramp, it has to be big enough to turn a wheelchair around, everything like that. So here's, um, I don't remember where this picture was taken now. I'm trying to think. I forget where I got this picture. My brain's not setting in right now. Um, but if, as you can see, they're adding a handicapped accessible ramp, right? Let me get my little annotation up here. It might be Hoover Dam, you're right. That might be where I got it. So as you can see, they're building a ramp, right? So it's gonna be here. Here's gonna be that switchback area, up, here and they're just going to keep going up. You can see that I'm a like artist, right? Is the Pat Tillman walkway? Thanks. Okay. I, I Googled it. I don't remember where I got it from, honestly. I, I did this last year, so please forgive me. You're probably right. That is the walkway. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, but they've got to create these so that people with handicaps can still get up there and enjoy the stuff we enjoy. Right? So that's important there. Handrails need to be at least 34 to 38 inches from the ground. The entrance platform of the house needs to be large enough to allow a patient in a wheelchair to be level. So even at the top of those stairs, there has to be an entrance platform. Um, you may have to look at alternative door locking mechanism, voice or card activated, remote control locks. Um, I just had a patient the other day that one of the PTs called me about and had me go out and see. Uh, it's not the other day, it was about two months ago now that I think about it before we had all this stuff the patient had a RFID chip put in his wrist. So he can roll up the ramp, get to his door, and he just has to hold up his wrist and it opens his door. 
He doesn't have to carry a key or anything with him. Which I thought was, that's really cool. Um, the RFID chip also evidently works in his car, so he can walk up to the car and wave his hand in front of the car. Yeah, like the Disney wristbands, exactly. I think RFID technology is the way we're going to go eventually. I really do. Um, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if you couldn't actually put like a storage drive in your arm somewhere and use that for storage via Bluetooth or stuff like that. Um, there's all kinds of neat RFID stuff out there that does stuff, um, you know, and obviously there's other body modification stuff as well, but there's stuff that we can do for that. Entry threshold should not be more than a half inch high. Patients in a wheelchair, what might we have to teach them to go over that threshold? Not a wheelie. But yes, it's a wheelie. What do we call it? Pop-up, yes. <laughs> Just don't say wheelie. Because they're like, wait, I have to do a wheelie? We need a pop-up, right? Door should not be too heavy. Eight pounds of pressure opening is accessible. Um, if they're heavier than that, we've got to adjust the door. Floor needs to be secure. No loose ends and throw rugs should be thrown. Doorways need to be at least 32 inches wide, right? Then that's allow patients to go in, discuss options to improve doorway clearance, pocket doors, reverse the direction of the door swing, insert hinges, you know, removal application of a curtain, anything to help patient get in and out of their home a little bit better. Um, the ability to take rims off the wheelchair can be useful when they, we go inside doorways. See if narrow wheelchair will accommodate this patient as well. So we may have to look at certain, if we can't modify the home, can we set up a secondary wheelchair the patient could transfer in that they can go into their home with, right? Because they do make narrower wheelchairs. And, you know, if you're a big guy, it might not work. But if you're a smaller person, it may be able to get a narrower wheelchair to help you maneuver around their home or the building, whereas it might not work in the community sense. Uh, bed should not be on wheels. I don't, who puts their bed on wheels? Um, probably I'm going to hear some of you guys have it on wheels. Um, it's easy for cleaning but it also means it shoots across the room if you try to lay down on it. Uh, transfers in and out of the bed from either side whenever possible. So you really should, if the patient has a bed and you're teaching them how to get in and out of the bed, the bed should be positioned in the middle of the room so they can get out each side so that they're not consistently getting out of one side and causing you know, problems at that point. Height of the bed needs to be adjusted allow transfers in and out of the bed. Bedside table should be free of clutter. Yeah, I'm guilty of that. And then cordless phone or cell phone should be at the bed and should be ideal, or at least one of those uh, medic alert things. Bathrooms, we need to get them an elevated toilet seat, right? Uh, grab bars, horizontal, vertical, or diagonal, depending upon what we need for them to get up. Um, you may not think about this until, you know, I, you may not think about a patient needing grab bars to get out of a wheelchair. Go spend, some, go, go spend a day at the gym and do a really, 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 really heavy leg day and then don't drink afterwards and don't stretch afterwards and then try to sit on the toilet and try to get up the next day. Right? Yeah. Some of you are going, yep, I've done that. Right. I mean, yeah, I had that experience where you go, okay, maybe I'm just going to stay here all day. We grab bar in my bathroom. Exactly. Right. So think about that and then think about it from the standpoint that it's not muscular pain soreness that they can't actually, it is a leg day test, right? That they actually can't do this just because of physical ability. Right, so that's the problem with it. Tub transfer bench, shower chairs are recommended. So here's the deal, and if they need a temporary shower chair, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. Because shower chairs are expensive, and you can't rent them. So once you buy them and put them in the shower, it's in there. Now, most of them can be removed, but if you have a patient that's got a stand-in shower that maybe has a removable shower head and stuff like that, you can go to Walmart and get one of those plastic garden chairs, and they work good enough for a short term period. I'm just gonna say that from experience. You know, they're like 10, 15 bucks versus a shower chair, which can be up to hundreds of dollars. So if it's, you know, part time where they need it for about two weeks, do that rather than investing in a good shower chair, unless you know they're gonna need it. Handheld showers are important, non skid floor sh shower mats. Um, I didn't even know that it was. Why are they so expensive, Dane? Well, because there's money in handicapped people. This is what I'm gonna say because we are a capitalist society. Um, how many of you guys have non-skid, like either stickers down on your floor in your shower or you know, a shower mat down in your shower? Does anyone have that? I bet the moms do. You know where you put that, no? Surprise, usually the parents do and the kids bath up right. 
You don't think about it, but what happens if you need that? Your husband better get to install in it, I guess, huh? Or your significant other, I guess I can't assume. Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so you have to think about that from your standpoint. So think about if you become injured, like literally look around your house tonight when we're done and realize, is my house handicap accessible or is it a landmine of areas that I could get hurt? Yeah. Uh, high wattage light needed for safety. So this is landmines for sure, exactly. My house is the same way, with all the electronic cords laying around. Um, in the bathroom, the light should be bright, right? This is not a place where you put a 30 watt soft white bulb in the bathroom for them. It needs to be bright light so everything can be lit up, right? Litten is a Pennsylvania term. Um, you want it bright inside. You know, this should be one of those where if it looks like you're staring into the sun at the light, you probably have it bright enough. Kitchen countertop heights vary, right? We may have to lower if the patient's gonna be working with a wheelchair in the kitchen. Um, front range controls are ideal. I don't have this and it won't go with my decor. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of the range is where are your controls for your, so ranges are your stoves, by the way, folks. So it was 1950. I think mine's about 1955, so I got you by five years. But where are your controls for your stove? Way in the back, right? Okay, good. So some of you have push buttons on front. Why do you think we put them all the way in the back, though? There's a reason. Kids, exactly, right? <laughs> Just learning all about your homes. We're going to go on like a tour soon. And go, this is my, everyone, come along. Go see my house. Um, no, you're not seeing my house. My house is a barrack right now. Just got back and threw everything everywhere. Uh, but we usually put them back there for kids, right? But when you start becoming PMA Cribs, yeah, PMA Cribs, exactly. That'd be like the worst episode of Cribs ever for me. That's what I love watching the news for now, just because like you get to see who's a serial killer by looking at their house. Oh yeah, you don't want a kitchen tour in my kitchen. Mm. Just imagine a kitchen from like a Norman Rockwell, Rockwell painting from 1950 and you're good. Yeah, I need HGTV to come into my house. Uh, so I think of those front range. So have any of you ever done an environmental assessment? Have any of you done for your family, like maybe a loved one who has gotten kind of feeble and stuff like that? Give you realistic expectations. Oh, it won't give you, it'd make you feel better about your house and my house, I'm just saying. Now, if I go to the one down in Tucson, maybe I might have you guys, but not up here. What am I two in Tucson? So who's gonna pay for the environmental assessment? What do you think? Well, I'm saying who's gonna pay for it? Insurance usually pays for it. You're right, they will usually pay for it. If insurance doesn't, there's federally funded needs. Um, where can you get info on, what's DME again? Durable medical equipment, good, right? Yeah, so that's all the stuff you need. Where can you get information on this? On what's covered and what's not covered? What's the best source you can use? Does anyone know? Now there's all kinds of retailers out there you could use. The website of their insurance, good, right? Or even just going to the general Medicare website because if Medicare covers it, there's a likelihood that their insurance covers it. And Medicare's got really good guidelines on when they'll approve a walk or when they'll approve crutches, stuff like that. And you can use the Medicare site really well for helping that. And there's, a, there's both a clinician side of the Medicare website and also a client side, so how many has Medicare. So I direct a lot of people to the Medicare website because it does provide a good bit of information on it. Um, there's not gonna be the next lecture on lesson tools. So all right, have we already covered this? Uh, Self-report instruments we already covered. So here's all kinds of tools for doing stuff. I'm not gonna go through the rest of this. You guys can read the rest of this. Sorry, I'm bored. No, we're not done yet. I still gotta talk about home health, but that's, I can talk about without having this stuff up. All right, so let's talk home health. Uh, let me see if I can get myself back in focus here. There, oh, come on, focus camera, thank you. All right, let's talk home health. So, Who's interested in doing home health in here? My clock is empty. Me, me. 
All right, why are you interested in doing home health? I'm curious as to what the reason is, because I can pretty much guarantee what I was going to say. Slow pace. Okay, good. I, I like that answer better than money, right? And you own schedule. That's the really thing. Honestly, the reason I like doing home health is my flexible schedule. It's more than just the money, the freedom, right? And then you can do it on the side, right? I can do this and still make okay money doing home health. I don't make a lot. I'll be 100% honest. I don't make a lot in home health. You think I would, but I don't. And that's, there you go, Ashley. There's a good comment. So right now, what are the laws on home health? What are the laws requiring for home health for PTAs? Right, 2,000 hours right now. That law is changing, right? So in order to do home health, you have to have indirect supervision approved or general supervision, right? Exactly. We call it indirect in Pennsylvania or we call it phone access, right? When is it changing? As soon as I can get them to sign the freaking law. Hopefully once we get out of this damn quarantine, um, right now no one's signing anything. Just to let you know, there's almost no law. It triggered. Oh my God, dude. I've been, so I started here. Five, uh, by the way, it's in 10 days, I have my fifth year at Pima. That's kind of terrifying to me. Um, but on top of that, on my first, my, after my first year, I started getting involved. That's when we started writing the new laws. So we started writing these laws four years ago and we still don't have them full, fully written. So that tells you how long it takes laws to get passed, right? So we started writing these laws, the 2000 hour law, the laws about text, everything like that almost four years ago. So it takes a while to get them passed. They will pass, they're written, they're approved, they're good to go. It just gets somebody from, you know, from Carson City to sign off on it. it I'm hoping it'll be done by the time you graduate, Ashley. That is my plan, like that is my, my new goal now is by the time you guys graduate or by the time that I'm too old to do it, um, we'll get it passed. It's written. Literally, we just have to pay somebody in Carson City to sign it. We have to get one of the senators or one of the, I don't know if the senators represent us, but one of them to sign it. Um, it's all written and done, right? So once that's done, the laws will change. Right now, you have to have worked 2,000 hours under the direct supervision of a PT before you can have phone access, indirect supervision, general supervision, whichever the state calls it. Most states have gotten rid of that now at this point. Almost every single one has. I think Arizona still has it, but Arizona still calls us certified PTAs and not licensed PTAs. So Arizona's a little behind the time. Um, California's gotten rid of it. Oregon, Washington, I think Utah got rid of it because it's illegal. We found that out. There's a PTA, I saw what they did there. Um, there's PTA in Oregon that actually sued the board and won. Yeah, I see. Uh huh. Let's see if something picked up on it. So there's a PTA in Oregon that sued the board saying, hey, I graduated from a school. You know, I got my license. Why can't I work under general supervision? And they won the case. And that's where it started going. We can't do this stupid 2000 hour rule. So that's why we're changing it. So that's the good news. Once that changes, then you can go into home health. I am going to recommend before you jump and dip your toes in home health, maybe, yeah. Um, before you jump and dip your toes into home health, get some experience in a clinic first. And also know yourself. I'm going to say some of you probably won't succeed at home health. I'm just gonna be honest with you. Because if you cannot be rigid and dogmatic about your own schedule, it's very hard to succeed at home health. You have to be rigid about this is when I'm working on this, this is when I'm working on that, this is when I'm working on that. Because if you can't and you just do whatever, it doesn't work. That's when I see people fail at home health is when, they're, when they do the magic, I'm just gonna do it and I'll figure it out as I go. You've gotta have a plan in place. You have to know I'm going to do my visits. I'm gonna tell my, my clinic, I do visits between eight and 12. And then from 12 to two every day, I'm spending time doing my notes. And you have to be very dogmatic about that. If you're not, it can become really just a nightmare. Um, especially if you have a PT that expects your notes to be in, you know, immediately. And depending upon the PT, some of the PTs expect that. How long do you have in a home health setting in order to get your notes in? Does anyone know? 
48 hours is ideal. Uh, most clinics will say 24, right, Melissa? It's 48 hours according to law. Interestingly enough, some states are seven days. Think about that for a second. Some states are seven days. Why? Anyway, this is why you have to be dogmatic. Now, let's say that you're not a very, very organized person, and you know how you have seven days to put your notes in. What do you think that's going to do? Going to get a little backed up, right? So you got to be paying attention. People that procrastinate don't do as well in home health. You've got to be dogmatic about it. As a PTA, it was a big change. I had never done, we didn't really teach about home health in my school. I didn't even know what home health was. Um, I had a clinic contact me about doing home health in Pennsylvania, and I'm like, sure. My first probably about a month of doing it, I failed miserably because I kind of procrastinated, and it took me, and I had to have a PT that sat down with me and said, look, I expect your notes in within 12 hours of you seeing a patient. And, you know, it was a reality check, exactly. It, it just shows you that if you don't, if you can't get kind of organized about it, it'll kill you. It just it will drive you nuts and you end up getting fired. So you have to be really important about knowing this. The nice part about home health is, again, is the flexibility and usually the money. Um, I'm doing virtual health. Sorry, I haven't talked about that. I was going to talk about that. Um, even though I'm being paid home, Chris. Okay. Well, I'm just saying some people do. Uh, so telehealth is considered, right now we are doing home health via telehealth, Russ. Um, because, you know, well, it depends. I still have one kid I see on a physical basis. But a lot of, the, I have a total of four kids right now that I see, and three of the four are telehealth right now because the parents just don't want me coming into the house. I will say telehealth is challenging. This is probably more challenging to me than I thought it was going to be because I like getting my hands on the patient and getting to do stuff. Um, well, yes and no, there's not a rule about it right now. So, and that's the thing is, uh, Medicare has kind of loosened the guidelines on telehealth. Now in Arizona, they can't. Arizona's already stated PTAs can't do telehealth. Yeah, so I, we've got to come up with better rules on telehealth. I'll openly admit that, but I don't see why we can't. If PT can do telehealth, um, there's no reason why PTAs can't do telehealth. I'm just saying. If PTs can do an evaluation via telehealth, we can do a treatment via telehealth, but that's beside the point. I'm, I'm big on pushing for telehealth. I like the idea because it really does help the rural community. I don't like it here in town. I think it's kind of dumb. Right, and what's it makes any different? Um, it's, it's billed differently, Russell. That's the major thing. It's billed differently. Uh, telehealth, bill, am I flashing or is it just my glasses? Okay, it's my glasses. Um, it is totally billed differently and reimbursed differently. It falls under the home health umbrella. No, I, I just saw a reflection with my glasses. I'm not going to flash. You don't have to worry about that. Um, it's, it falls under the home health umbrella of the APTA, but it's starting to branch off into its own field. So right now it falls under that umbrella, but it's built a little differently. And telehealth doesn't reimburse very well right now. Um, it's just... Yeah, it's definitely built differently if you went into an outpatient clinic, definitely. Um, and that's the thing is right now, I think if you, were, if you were a true outpatient clinic and you started doing telehealth before all this pandemic stuff, I think you would have to file for being a home health agency as well, I think. Um, but right now, because the laws are pretty much out the window, it's pretty much the Wild West all over PT right now. Uh, it's Wild West all over medicine in general. There are loopholes galore, yes, 100%. Um, and then who gets home health PT and who doesn't? There's not hard rules on that either, which is kind of scary, or gets uh, telehealth. There's not a rule on why this patient's getting telehealth and this patient isn't. Um, I, I don't, again, telehealth's interesting. I don't really care for it. I'm going to be honest. I like getting my hands on my patient. Um, now, there are some patients that I see in home health that I'd rather see <laughs> via telehealth, um, those hoarders and stuff like that, but, you know, it's, it's okay. Uh, telehealth, I, I, we don't have a lot of laws on it yet. So I think we'll have, after this, we're going to have to tighten down the laws. We're going to say these patients can be seen via telehealth, these can't. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. 
I, that's the thing is I, I, most of my assessment nowadays is patient continues to progress in physical therapy because I can't really assess them. It's really hard to do an assessment. I trust them to take their own vitals. That's the fun. Uh, especially fun for my kids that have uh, cystic fibrosis. Uh, I have to hope that the mom knows how to take proper vitals. But so in a home health setting, there are some good things, there's some bad things. What are some bad things about home health? What do you think, what scares you about doing home health other than me? Stranger danger, good. Yeah, location, not knowing what you're walking into, right? If I tell you to go see a patient that is east of Boulder City or Boulder Highway right now, okay, see some of you are going, nope, nope. Or how about north of the stratosphere? Just going north of the stratosphere. Exactly. Um, so what's concealed? Uh, remind me to answer that then before we're done. Mike, I'll answer the concealed carry then at the end. I don't want to talk about it right now. So just remind me of that in a little bit. Um, I take all of them. You're exactly right. Just like your husband, I take all my patients. It doesn't matter where they're at. I don't care who they are. Um, I will go into whatever community, wherever. I have no problem with that. That's why I'm, I think I'm valuable to uh, my home health agencies because if they say I've got a patient in Pahrump, I'm going to Pahrump, right? If they say, you know, one of my kids I treat here and in Kingman. His dad lives in Kingman. His mom lives here. So once a month I have to go to Kingman because I want to do a review with dad on the exercises. I'm driving to Kingman. I get paid for it. They pay me really well. The family does. Um, but, you know, wherever they want to send me, I'll go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I say, Ian's right, I say east, all of a sudden you get a little nervous, right? Now, let's change the view. What if I said Summerlin? Right? Yeah, that's the thing. See how those, the, those change us, right? What about... Um, what if I said something like uh, Cheyenne and Lamb? Yeah, okay, so this is the thing. Right, this is what you have to understand. So how do we decide where we treat? Well, when you sign up with the home health agency, one of the things they're gonna ask you is, what zip codes do you wanna treat in? Right, so that's usually, depends on the agency, it does. Uh, most agencies will just ask you what zip code you wanna operate out of. And usually that's exactly right. Jenna, uh, Jenna's right, usually we take what the PTs won't. Um, but they'll say, you know, what, mo like most of my agencies I'm assigned on will say, where do you wanna take zip codes for? And so you have to know the zip codes in where you wanna treat, right? My zip code here is 89119. I know a lot of PTs won't take patients here just because it's not a 100% safe neighborhood, right? But they'll pay a little better for me to go see these patients. North of the stratosphere is the big one. North of the stratosphere, a lot of people won't take. Any of the letter streets or Martin Luther King, a lot of PTs and PTAs won't take. I'll take them, it's fine. I'm not scared of them. I mean, if I'm gonna get hurt, I'm gonna get hurt anywhere else. Yeah, the, you know the letter streets, right? And that, honestly, you'll find in most most major metropolitan areas, those are the same, that's the same thing on most metropolitan areas. I don't know what it is about Martin Luther King, but that street for some reason in almost every city was the same in Philadelphia. Those areas are kind of the worst areas of town. I don't understand why they did that. Um, and letter streets are the same thing usually. The letter streets are, or the letter streets and number streets cross. <laughs> yep. um, so be aware that you have to kind of set your boundaries. If you're, I'm going to say some of you ladies, watch where you are willing to treat at. Because you have to understand that you're by yourself. Some of the guys too, but you know, it's, you're by yourself when you're treating patients. So it can sometimes be scary. Um, I've treated in a household with gang members in them. And, you know, it, it, can, it can be a little dis disconcerting to see, you know, somebody at the table cleaning their glocks while you're sitting treating their mother. Yeah, living downtown light. 
colors do you wear? Uh, yeah, I usually wear just whatever scrubs I have. Honestly, I don't, I don't think that far deep into it. I'll be 100% honest. I probably should think more about that, but I, I don't. And you'll find what's really interesting is in some of those gang affiliated neighborhoods, they will protect you because you're coming to see, you know, you're coming, you're coming to see mama or, you know, whoever you're coming to see, right? Abuelo, you're coming to see them to take care of them and they're actually okay with it. Exactly. Um, I've had an area where I've pulled up in my truck and I was, I got out of my truck and they're already starting to eyeball my truck and they're, I, they're like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, I'm here to see this person in this house. And they're like, don't worry, your truck will be here when you get back. We'll make sure of it. So if I didn't talk to you, there's a chance my truck wouldn't be. Just saying. Um, so just be aware of those kind of things, right? I'm not trying to scare you out of home health, but be understand. So before you do home health, Drive up, drive around town and try to figure, yeah, you do, that's why I have, that's why I have the verse in now, I'll be honest. Um, drive around town and see what areas you're not willing to treat in. Uber can be effective. Uh, well, I mean, you could, you might not be there when you get out. See what areas you're willing to treat in. Um, you know, it's Summerlin, some, it's Henderson used to be pretty good. Now, honestly, there's a lot of crazy people in Henderson. I'm just being serious, right? Yeah, it, it depends on what you're willing to do. It is. Um, money-wise, how much do you guys think PTAs make money-wise? In home health. Yeah. Let's see, let's see if Melissa, because Melissa probably knows. Yeah. About 35, so anywhere from 45 to 65, um, unless you're doing PT or PEDS. Um, yeah, Ian had a big smile with that, all right? Yeah, $80 an hour would be ideal. Unless you're doing PEDS. If you're doing PEDS, you can get reimbursed as low as $10 an hour. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, 80 is PTs. Or 80 is, if they're offering you $80 an hour, there's something wrong with that treatment. Just be aware of that. If a home health agency ever calls you and says, I've got this patient in such and such an area and we're, pay we're paying you know, $80 a visit, be a little skeptical, just saying. Um, that usually means that it's either A, not in a really good part of town or B, you've got to climb through the patient's window to get in the house because they're a hoarder. Um, I've had that before. So usually, I mean, they'll usually pay people to go see patients like that. It's just, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, I've seen everything from normal patients to, you know, hoarders. Uh, I've seen people that, you know, I think one of the underserved areas, it'd be interesting to put together a home health agency that would see people that are actually homeless. Um, it'd be interesting, you know, I, I, I live on the corner of this street and this street. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting, right, Mike? I, I always thought about that. I thought that, you know, the, why do they... Pro bono, you probably end up being. You're exactly right, Jenna. Um, but why do they don't get it? Why they don't get any health care at all? So we could provide them with a lot of health care that they don't normally get. Uh, it's just an interesting thought. I wouldn't say that I do that pro bono because I couldn't live then. But you know, like I said, so depending on most people, yeah. Nice. Seeing most people at the clinic with health care. Okay. Well, they, that comes sometimes, happy, especially if they got some like TRICARE of that. Yes, yeah, uh, the homeless population is definitely going up right now with this pandemic for people losing their jobs and losing their homes, which is kind of sad. But um, but the first thing you need to do is you need to find agencies. You need to find an agency that's going to hire you. I'm not going to direct you as to which agencies are good and which agencies are bad, right? Well, you don't always have to have a PT to work with because sometimes the agencies will assign you to a PT depending upon how their agencies work, right? So it depends upon what you do. I don't have a specific, well, I have a PT that I work with in my private care. But if I do a home health agency, it is. It is hard. Um, but the, most of the agencies in town will do that if you work with them. There is, it, I think we're going to see a lot more home health shortly, uh, especially after we kind of get out of this mess that we're in now because I think there's going to be a lot of patients that need it. Yeah, private, well, I consider private care is cash pay. 
cash pay is what I call private care. That's my four clients that I see, they don't, have, I don't get paid insurance. They pay me cash when I leave. That's just the way we've worked it. Um, or they'll pay me Zelle or no, I still keep, we still keep track of it. I've, the PT's got his own incorporation. We still documentation and we document how much money you receive, how much money goes out, everything like that. So as long as you're do business legit, you can do it. Now, this isn't like I call up a patient and says, yo, I, you know, I'll, I'll come see you. It's going to be 25 bucks. And they're like, well, 22 and I'll make 23. No, we, we have contracts with our patients. Um, and he's a really pretty astute uh, business guy. We've got contracts for two years with most of our patients. And so a lot of times, you know, some of the patients do pay every visit, but one of my kids pays me for a year. Yeah, you do need an actual, you, you, you are a business yourself, Russell. That's the thing is, you don't necessarily have to have a business per se, because you can be a sole proprietorship. There's a lot of business rules for that. That's what I, that's what I, build, or I uh, classify myself. I'm not employed with Andrew that I work with, right? Andrew, I'm not an employee of Andrew. I am a self-contractor. So I have to manage all of my taxes and everything myself, which can be another challenge to home health. It's very rare. It used to be, used to be able to go sign up and be full-time with the home health agency and they paid you a salary and took your benefits and everything like that. That's not so much anymore. Now you're independent and you have to manage your own money. Um, some of the benefits of home health is sometimes you can get paid every day. So, you know, a lot of home health agencies, once you've done your documentation, once you've seen your patients, at the end of the day, you can go in and get a check for the patients you saw. Um, I mean, theoretically, as long as you're still under a PT. Um, you know, as long as they're still getting evaled and as long as you're following, there's nothing that would violate a law for that. As long as they're still being evaluated on the same schedule and everything like that, absolutely. Um, that's why, you know, Andrew is the guy that I work with. You know, that was this thing. We, we ran into each other in a home health clinic and we had a patient that he saw an, an older lady who was a grandmother of one of these kids. And they mentioned that they'd really like to have their kids seen in the home setting. And so that's why he kind of started his own, it's almost a concierge PT is really what it is. Um, that's really big on the East Coast right now. Concierge PT is huge on the East Coast, especially in areas like the Hamptons, uh, the Outer Banks in North Carolina, all the kind of ritzy areas, North Georgia. Uh, the, Right, exactly. Uh, concierge PT on the East Coast. I know, I know one of the PTs that I used to work with in Pennsylvania bought a huge uh, Airstream, I think it's something like that. I think it's called one of those big RVs and gutted the interior of it and turned it into a clinic. So he's got weights, he's got a wall, like, you know, TheraBand, everything else in the clinic. So he drives. Concierge PT is similar to concierge doctor. So concierge means you... Concierge is a fancy way of saying you're basically like a mercenary PT in the setting. You, you basically go see the patients for cash. Yeah, on call. Um, yeah, it's a little bit different than on call because on call typically means you're only going to be there when the patient needs you. Concierge, a lot of times you set contracts up with the patient. So you're going to say, I'll be here to see you. But the downside is you are on call then. Uh, it's usually more expensive, exactly. Um, the guy that I know that said that, like I said, he, he's a concierge PT and he works up in the Hamptons. He charges 250 a visit. I think it'd be a great idea, Melissa. I've thought of it too. But he charges 250 a visit, and if his PT does it, his PT or if his because he has PT, if his PTA is seeing them, they get 200 a visit. So he gives them a cut of 100 or 50 dollars if you're seeing the PT instead of him. Um, and the people in the Hamptons pay it. It's ridiculous. Um, the concierge doctors there make serious bank um, just because they're, they, you know, the rich people want their free access to whenever they want health care. Um, there was a TV show about that a while back, and I don't remember what it was on USA, and I can't think of what show it was. But if you ever want to learn about what it's like to be a concierge doctor, there's one on USA, and I can't think of what it was called. Hank Med, I think, was the show or something like that. Um, but yeah, so, you know, we can do that. There it is, Royal Pains. Thank you very much, Russell. That was it. Um, but it's, that was a pretty accurate uh, 
that was a pretty accurate representation of what concierge is like. For most home health, you're not that. For most home, home health, like Melissa said, you are usually working with the PT. Um, they did film it there, yeah. Um, and you're working with specific PT specifically. Now, I don't do that. I'm, I'm really a mercenary PTA. I consider myself that quite frequently. I'll go wherever somebody needs me. It doesn't matter what PT it is. And now you have to be really kind of good at, I don't say I'm good. That's not what I'm, I'm not trying to be humble here. You have to be kind of good at what you do and have PTs trust you in order to do that. Because, you know, you're taken over for a PT that may not know you. So they want to know that you know your stuff. Um, I'll go wherever they want. I don't care. Send me to Pahrump. Send me to, you know, Baker. I don't care. Pay me. I'll go wherever they want to send me. Um, and be aware, you have a lot of negotiation in your rate. Right? That's the thing is you have to understand if, you know, if the clinic's only going to offer you $25 an hour well, or $25 a visit, you may want to consider somewhere else. I don't mind taking low rates for visits with peds because I'm helping the kids. I'm not doing that to get rich. Um, now, the kids I see for my, our, our concierge business, they pay. Um, they pay a lot. They can afford to. Uh, one, of my, one of the kids I see is one of his neighbors is one of the big boxers. So I'll just go with that. Um, but yeah, so... You know, those are the things. It just depends on what you're willing to do. I, again, would not start home health right off the bat. It's really rough to get started off the bat. And it's really hard to find PTs. That's why a lot of times it's better to network and find who you like to do stuff with and get your, get your feelers out there and start finding people. Most of the PTs I've worked with have been friends of PTs that I've worked with. So they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, I, got, I get this PTA, and he's pretty good at doing whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that's how I get networked in. Um, I don't know how Melissa's husband does it. I, I, I know that he works for some specific PTs. I just, I don't know enough about him at this point. It's not taking any Melissa. I just don't know him at all. Um, the way I do it is I will go to clinics and I will apply and say, or to home health agencies, right? And I'll say that, um, you know, I'm here to, I want to apply for a job. They'll tell me to go to the back and speak to Ate, And I'll go back and speak to Ate. It's true. Um, it's, especially when you go back to the back room and you say, Ate, and 20 people turn around and say, yes. Um, most home health agencies in the Valley are Filipino owned. I will say that it's, I don't know if Melissa's husband's had a different experience than I have, but almost every single home health agency I worked in. Yep. See, and I'll say that the Clint, the home health agencies that weren't Filipino owned were the ones that were the shadiest. I'm just going to be flat out and honest about that. The ones that I've worked with that haven't been Filipino owned have been the shadier of them. So, you know, you learn really quick, you know, who you're going to work with, who you're not going to work with and what you're willing to put up with. That's the important thing. Uh, what are you willing to put up with as a PTA? How much money are you willing to take? And again, you can make full-time home health be a gig, but a lot of PTs and PTAs don't do that. A lot of PTs and PTAs will only do part-time home health and then have a full-time job elsewhere, right? Or they'll work PRN elsewhere. That was my big thing in Pennsylvania. You know, I worked a lot of PRN work and then did home health to supplement my PRN, right? And PRN's a totally different beast. That's working at a clinic as needed. Um, you can make good money. Downside, you can see people that, yeah, exactly. Downside, you can see people that are hoarders. Downside, you can see people that aren't clean. Right. I've walked in homes where I felt like I had bugs crawling all over me after leaving the homes. Floors can be sticky. Um, you may have to deal with kids. And I try, I've told patients before, I'm not a babysitter where they think that I've got to babysit their kids while they're doing the therapy. I'm not going to babysit their kids. That's not what I'm brought in for. Um, the big thing I hate in home health personally, help them clean. Yeah. Well, you don't have time for that either, Bison. Most, and I'm going to say this is generalized here. Most home health agencies require you to see a patient for 45 minutes. Um, see, I don't know if Melissa's, Melissa, is that your husband's agency as well? They require you to at least see a 45 minute visit with the patient. Do you know? Okay. The ones I've been with before have require a minimum of 45 minute visit. 
Um, and I think there's a law about that I don't know off the top of my head. I think there's a law that you have to see them for 45 minutes and they can bill for an hour from the agency. Um, I think there's a law on that. I don't know enough about that. If I opened the home health agency, I would. Um, but understand that you have to calculate in yeah, they don't want me to see that long, no, but I force them to, I'll be honest, I do. Um, I, I'm, I, and that's why people don't like me, but anyway. Um, when you see them, you understand, when you're getting paid that rate, if you're getting paid, you know, $60 an hour to see a patient, you have to take into account that's not only to see the patient, but that's to do the documentation after the patient and also travel time, right? And let's say like me, before I, before I bought my Versa, I'm driving around in my truck and my truck gets about eight miles to the gallon. It starts cutting into the cost of your money, right? So you have to be thinking about that, right? So you have to think maybe look at a different car. You may wanna get a smaller car, or a cheaper car, like an older Honda Civic or like me, I got a Versa. Uh, like Dr. Reskin, anything to save you a little bit of money, right? Um, plus, you know, Prius is no one wants to steal them anyway. Um, same thing with my Versa. No one wants to steal my Versa. They look at it and go, oh my God, that's sad. He drives Versa and he's in healthcare. Um, but you have to be aware of that. That's why you're getting paid. You're getting paid because you're going into an environment that is unknown and you have to do documentation and travel on top of it. You know, for example, there's nothing wrong. I mean, there's nothing for me to see a patient in Lake Las Vegas and then my next patient to be in Centennial Hills. That's why you have to get really good and dogmatic about your schedule because I want to try to get three patients in the same area during a time period. So I want to see, you know, three patients in Lake Las Vegas before I go to Centennial Hills and see three more patients or see maybe a patient along the way to Centennial Hills. So you have to get really good at documentation. My biggest pet peeve is arriving at the patient's house, knocking on the door and no one answering. Or not ready, yeah. So here's the deal is if in most clinic or most home health agencies, if you knock on the door, they're not there, you can't get a hold of them, you can't treat them that day, you don't get paid. Some home health agencies do charge the patient like a $25 fee and then you get $20 of that fee, but it's very rare. Most home health agencies will say, if you don't see that patient, you don't get paid. I've had it where I've driven the one of the one of the ones that was the best. I called a guy, say I'm on the way to him, he's down in Pahrump, and he's in BFE and prompt. And it took me forever to get out to where he was. I knocked on the door, I knocked on the door, I knocked on the door. He's not there, he's not there, he's not there. So I call him and he says, oh, we went down to Walmart. We'll be down here a little bit. We'll be back in about an hour. So guess what I had to do for that hour? Sit there and wait if I wanted to get paid. Right, so that can be a problem. Um, it's nothing for me to knock on a door, and I, this is the truth when you're dealing with old people, you know, classroom documentation, exactly, you better have a 4G hotspot with you. Um, that's one of the reasons why I did buy a hotspot, is because that way I can still do my documentation when I'm on the road. Um, nothing for you to knock on a door of an older man's home and him to answer the door in his tidy whities Yeah, I mean, if you have another patient in the front area, absolutely, Chris, you could see somebody else. Um, but in the case that I saw him, I didn't have anyone else in the prompt area. I even called my agency and said, hey, you guys have anyone down here I could see while I'm waiting for Mr. Johnson because he's being a total knucklehead. And they didn't. Right? So you kind of have to be able to, that's why managing your schedule is important. I should have had more than one patient down there so that if I went and saw him and he wasn't there, I could move on to the next patient. Right? Because he made me wait an hour, I had to move all my other patients. So I had to be on the phone and call my other patients saying, going to be about an hour late to your appointment. Can we move it? Or is it, can I see you a little bit later in time? Uh, the other thing with me is I see patients all points of the day. I will go see patients at four in the morning. I will go see patients at 10 o'clock at night. And that's really valuable to some home health agencies because, you know, most people only want to see people from eight to five. And in this valley, eight to five is not a normal schedule. Yeah, I've seen, people, I've seen a, a lot of military people want to get seen or bright and early, 4 a.m., 5 a.m. Yep. Had a lot of ex, you know, ex-Air Force, you know, 
ex army or marine stuff like that where they want to be seen four or five a.m. They want to be seen at four or five a.m. Okay, I just won't go to the gym then, and I'll go see them instead. It works. Nice part about that is I get somebody in early in the morning. I have plenty of time to see somebody else. Maybe take a siesta around noon and be good with it. Um, safety, because somebody asked about concealed carry. You have to be really aware of what your home health agency's poly, policy is on it. You are not, some home health agencies, you are not allowed to conceal carry. And if your home health agency says that, and you tell you you're not allowed to conceal carry and you conceal carry, they can get that documented on your PT license that you violated agency rules by concealed carrying in a patient's home. There needs to be a better law on this. There isn't right now. There needs to be a better law on if it's okay to conceal carry or if it's not a concealed carry. I'm, I'm guessing probably eventually we're gonna be a non-concealed carry for healthcare providers. I'm gonna be honest. Um, Pennsylvania just passed that law a little while back that if you're a healthcare provider, you're seeing somebody in the home health setting, you are not allowed to conceal carry. It's just the way it is. Um, that being said, if you're interested, if you're interested in that and you are going to conceal carry, you need to pick a weapon that is easily concealed in scrubs. Right? Carrying a desert eagle is not concealed carry. Just saying. The other thing is you have to have your CCW. As of now, some companies you can, some companies can't. Yep. I have one that is 100% you can't. They will not allow me to conceal carry. And that then ironically enough, that's one agency that wants to see people in the bad areas of town. Right. Um, so that means that my concealed carry weapon gets stored in my, you know, center console of my truck that's locked. It's just the way it is. You have to understand what your agency's rules are. Um, but I'm just saying, and the other thing is, is if, and I'm going to say this is totally from a non-healthcare standpoint. If you are going to conceal care, what could affect your patient load? It could. It could, yeah. Absolutely. If I don't, does your husband conceal care? Just curiously, Melissa? I'm just curious. You don't have to answer if you don't want to. Yeah. Okay, so he doesn't. Right, and that's the thing. You have to understand your patients as well. Um. I know, I know some of the, some of the clinicians I've seen that do conceal carry, they don't conceal carry it on them. They conceal carry a panel in their backpack. So what's wrong with me? So many things, so many things. Um, anyway, are you saying I'm bad because I do or not? What I'm getting on about the conceal carry, if you are going to conceal carry, even if it's not for home health, it's just in general, you need to be trained on how to use the gun. Don't just go buy, you know, a Glock 17 and start conceal carrying it. First of all, you have to have the conceal carry license, right? So you need to go take the course. The course will teach you some simple gun safety stuff. The biggest, the biggest thing that I have problems with people, and this is coming from military, is when I see people just buying guns because they're cool. You know, I'm going to buy this gun because it's cool. I'm going to buy a Desert Eagle. I love watching people shoot desert eagles. It's hilarious. It's great uh, business for hand therapy clinics. Um, bring your nunchucks. Uh, yeah, again, that's still considered a weapon, so you have to be aware of that. Even in Nevada here, I don't know if you know this, but if you conceal carry nunchucks, you still have to have a concealed carry. Even the baton, yep. So um, where I'm from in Pennsylvania, they had a weird law that if you became a first, second, third, fourth, any rank black belt, you had to apply for a concealed carry permit. That was part of our black belt test is we had to go and take, go get concealed carried. Um, make the flashlight works well. Yeah, and that's, I, I've honestly thought about that. I don't know if there's a market for it, but I've often thought of teaching a self-defense course for home health and therapists and nurses. I bet I could do that. I bet there'd be interest in it. I wonder, now that gets me, that gets me kind of businessy thinking. Hmm. Anyway, um, can't do it now, <laughs> but just be aware if you're going to conceal carry, know the rules of your state, know the laws of your state, be trained in a weapon. Don't just carry it because it's cool, right? I know I will openly admit, here's, here's the thing, I am a big support proponent of the Second Amendment. I have more guns than I need. Uh, I'll come back to that one. Um, 
I have, I, I have a bit, I'm hundred percent, but if tomorrow I had to give up my semi-automatic rifles in order to help prevent other kids from dying from semi-automatic rifles, I would do it in a heartbeat. I am that passionate about gun safety and gun law. Um, I just am. Gun restrictions and gun safety do save lives. I think we should have a universal background check and universal registration for guns. If you have to have car insurance, you should have to have gun insurance if you have guns. That kind of makes sense to me, but what do I know? Maybe I'm just thinking logically. Um, open carry in Texas or Arizona. So I've never done it in Arizona. Uh, I totally forgot that they have open carry. I, I agree, Chris. Um, and and it's, uh, honestly, it's people that have never fired at another human being. Is Nevada open carry? Huh, never paid attention to that. I've just got my license since I got here. That just shows me that I've never paid attention to that. Um, mainly because I, I don't think I want to walk around. Um, they don't require anything, right? Um, yeah, I don't understand open carry, but that's beside that. I'm not even going to go into that. That's a, that's a whole cow of its own that I don't want to go down. And I saw cow, so that was what stuck. Um, so I do know a therapist in Arizona that does open carry. Um, but what he does is when he's calling his patients, he will inform them that he, and he's one of those guys that's, you know, wears like the AR-15 to Starbucks and stuff like that. I'm just going to leave it at that. He informs them that he does open carry. And is it going to be a problem that he open carries? Because if it is, he will assign a different therapist to them. Um, I think open carry is stupid because open carry advertises to everyone around you that you've got a gun. Um, and I think the home health agency should inform them that therapists may carry weapons. I don't know if they do or not. I never asked. It's probably a good question now that I think about it. Good news is the kids I treat, I usually don't have to worry about that. I'm just going to be honest. Most of the kids I treat, yeah. You have to have five gates to get in their community. Um, but if you treat on some of these scary areas, you may feel that you need that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't feel that I need my gun anyway, but it's nice to have. But I don't know. I mean, if you're in those areas, if you can open carry, it's technically legal. Um, but unless they pass laws on medical professionals. And that's what I think we need to look at is when is it okay for medical professionals to carry and when is it not okay for medical professionals to carry? That's totally off topic. I don't know the answer to that. And that would take a lot of thought process. But you're right, it could reduce your caseload unless, like you said, because some patients don't want guns in their home. And if a patient told me that they don't want my gun in their home, guess what I'm going to do? Leave it in my car. I'm not that attached to it that I have to carry it with me. It's just the way it is. If it bothers the patient, then you shouldn't do it. Um, what else can we talk about at home health? Quarters. And then also reporting. Once you guys are licensed, you are mandatory reporters. What does mandatory reporters mean? Does anyone know what mandatory reporting means? Yeah, any type of abuse you see, you have to report or crimes. Exactly. So it doesn't. It's not only it's not only abuse. It's crimes as well. So you see somebody dealing dope out of the home that you're treating in. You have to report that. You are mandatory to report that. It is required that you report that. Yeah, you feel like it's in the name. No, I mean, uh, uh, whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, only if it's Adderall. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't say that. That was a joke. That was a joke. You are required to report it. So abuse, that includes a lot of people think that we have to report pediatric abuse, child, child, child abuse. We also have to report elder abuse. So don't ignore that. And also then in between, any type of abuse in between those kids and those seriously senior adults, right? That includes spousal abuse, physical abuse of significant other or a homemate, anything to that effect, you have to report it. Most health, home health agency will tell you, you report it to your PT of record. But you may, if it's, if it's an extenuating circumstance, like the kid I told you guys I saw that had the major burns on them, I reported that immediately to the police because I felt it was my duty. I called my PT first 
but then I called the police and stayed until the police arrived. So you are required to report any of that type of abuse. Just be aware of that. That also includes unhealthy, unsanitary, or unsafe living conditions. So you go see a patient and they're a hoarder house. You also have to report that. Most times you have to report that to your agency. I'm going to tell you exactly what your agency is going to do about it. Nothing. But at least you report it. Pet abuse. Yeah, actually, yeah, actually, I've never gotten that. Luckily, I'm, I'm glad he did. But I've never had, you know, animal abuse. Luckily. I mean, I've had kids that pull the dog's tail. But I don't consider that animal abuse. I consider that bad parenting. And you teach them not to pull on Fido's tail. But yeah, if I saw animal abuse, I'd have to, that would, oh God, that would be. Child abuse, I don't tolerate. I'll just let you guys know that. Pet abuse would be about the same. I'd, I'd probably lose my cool. Child abuse, it's really hard for me not to lose my cool. Um, that really, that bugs me a lot. Probably because, you know, I grew up with, I, 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 obviously, as you guys can tell, I kind of grew up in an abusive family. So I, I'm kind of sensitive to it. That doesn't surprise me at all. Right, exactly. If you grew up with animals, a lot of times you won't, right? Um, so, you know, like I said, know your areas, know you want where you want to treat, know what type of patients you want to treat. Because here's the on home health, we see everything. Strokes, TBIs, total knee replacements, total hip replacements. Most of the patients I see are fall under typically three categories in the adult setting. Yeah, MS. Most of the patients I see at least fall under three settings, either deconditioning, right? Generalized deconditioning. Those are the patients that just got out of the, uh, thank you, Alex. Patients just got out of the hospital and they're sick. Total hips, total knees, and backs. Those are most of what I see a lot of when I'm seeing them. Um, and that's the main things that a lot of uh, you see in home health. MS, I haven't seen a lot of MS. I'd really like to see more. And not just see more butts, see more patients. Um, what else do I want to talk about with home health? Craziest thing you've seen. Uh, so the craziest thing I've seen, well, let's see. So nastiest thing I've seen. I saw here in Vegas down on the uh, on Lake Mead Road going out towards Henderson where I went and saw a patient that literally their carpet was moving. There were that many bugs in the house. And like the, and when I say bugs, it wasn't just cockroaches. It was everything under the sun. Um, they were a hoarder. They had food drops all over the house and bugs and yeah, it's, those scrubs got destroyed as soon as I came out of there. They did not go home with me. Um, and I keep two separate baskets, by the way. I have two milk crates. One milk crate is for my patients that are what I consider the unclean patients. And then one milk crate is for the patients that are okay, normal clean patients. Uh, they didn't even make it to the car. They did not. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. They went in the trash can. Um, let's keep extra scrubs with you as well. Uh, but anyway, the milk crate that I have for patients that are unclean, every piece of equipment, again, if you're going home health, you have to buy everything yourself. I have weights, I have ankle weights, TheraBand, anything that I take with me into that setting, I have to provide. So I have one basket that is completely hosable equipment that I can literally take it out back of my house here and spray it down with a hose. And then I have one basket that I have for other houses. Dumbbells only, yep. So any of that you have to pay paying attention to. Um, that was, I would say the dirtiest I saw, and I'm not joking, I went in the house and I thought, man, that carpet looks weird. And then I realized the carpet was moving. And that was kind of, it wasn't carpet. Well, it was a form of carpet, it was bug carpet. Um, I realized that now, but it was still one of those, hey. Um, the other weird one, I had one back in Pennsylvania that was totally weird. I saw a patient on a uh, Friday night um, it was an older man I was seeing. He was upstairs. It was the father of a patient and they were having a swingers party downstairs. That was a little weird. I'm just going to admit that. Um, so that was kind of the, the strangest one I've ever seen or the craziest I've ever seen. 
you know, grandpa's upstairs and they're having whatever they do downstairs. Um, that was probably the craziest. <laughs> um, but yeah, bugs all the time. I've seen hoarders. Um, but most of them I see are just normal people, right? A lot of unclean houses or what I would consider unclean house. But again, unclean house to me is doesn't smell like bleach. Um, a lot of kids, you know, a lot of stuff laying around the house and, you know, Legos everywhere and matchboxes and Hot Wheels and stuff like that. Um, and a lot of patients that need the home health that maybe aren't getting it. For home health, what should you be your goal for home health? What do you think my number one goal for home health is for a patient? Yes, exactly. Get them to outpatient. That is, that should be, if you were a good clinician, that should be your goal. The goal your goal should be to get a patient to outpatient, right? What would be a good kind of guideline on when they're good for outpatient? Two weeks would be ideal. That's, I mean, I have a goal of three, it's my max. But what would, be, what would tell you the patient's ready for outpatient? Yeah, they're leaving the home. Yep. At the point that they're leaving the home, they really should not be seen by home health. If they're leaving the home and going to Walmart, they're leaving the home and going, you know, down to play bingo with Suzanne, they really should be an outpatient. They have more tools, they have more stuff to do. I can't carry a full ISC machine with me. I can't carry a laser unit. I mean, I guess I could carry it, but I'm not about to pay the money for that. Right? I could, yeah. I'm just not going to pay the money. I'm cheap. Um, if they are driving and there are certain states that have the laws, if the patient is able to drive, they have to be seen by outpatient. That kind of just makes sense to me. I don't know about you guys, but it kind of makes sense to me. If the patient's able to drive, they should be going to outpatient. Nevada doesn't have any. The home health agencies set their own rules. Um, a lot of home health agencies will try to keep you to keep the patient on caseload. Oh, they've been on home health for four weeks. That's not necessarily a good agency, right? Um, ultimately, it's the PT's decision. And there are some times where the PTs and the PTAs disagree. Where I think patients should be good for discharge and the PT thinks they're not, or the other way around. And that's where you have to communicate. They have to understand where you're coming from. You have to understand where they're coming from. Um, and be able to and not only communicate with them, but also OT, um, nursing. Um, you can do wound care in the home health setting. Most times it's a wound care nurse that does it, but some agencies do wound care. Um, I love treating kids in the home health setting because it's amazing how much more they are willing to do at their home. When you see them at a clinic, they're like, I don't want to go to therapy. Right, but when they're at home and they're in their environment, they're comfortable, especially kids that have autism, they're just so much easier to treat in a home health setting. Um, like I've told you multiple times, I have that, the one kid who has cerebral palsy, <coughs> excuse me, that I see down at um, the park down there on Eastern, whatever the name of that park, Sunset Park. That's where I see him most of the times because that's why I get, I, his mom brings him out there and we go hunt and Pokemon Go. But even regular patients don't want to do it. You're already here, exactly. But even re even adults don't want to come to <laughs> help patient. Just imagine a kid. Um, and you know, then it's just like anything else, though. Just like any clinic, there are good inpatient, there are good outpatient clinics, there are bad outpatient clinics. There are good home health agencies, there are bad home health agencies. My job is not to tell you what a bad home health agency is. I'm just going to tell you that I'm not going to tell you steer you which way to go or even with outpatient clinics. I could steer you away from many of the outpatient clinics, but that's not my job. That's showing bias towards outpatient clinics. I don't want to do it. I joke about ATI a lot, but only because I know a lot of the ATI therapists. Um, and they kind of feel the same way I do at times. Um, but I, you know, I, I even know the guy that's the regional director for ATI, and I joke with him about it, but he doesn't usually like my jokes, just saying. Um, but yeah, it's not my job to steer you for clinics. Um, but you know, you'll learn quick. Uh, the best way to find out what agencies not to go for is go to an APTA meeting and talk to the people that are doing home health there. They'll tell you. They don't like our jokes either. <laughs> That's great. Um, 
what kind of settings can you work in home health? You can work in every, like I said. So strokes, TBIs, women's health, men's health, urinary health, whatever you want to call it. Any of that stuff applies. Do you have any other questions about home health that I can answer? No, they really don't. Not at all. Even regional directors of hospitals don't like jokes. They, they think you're mocking the employer and really what you're doing is you're just poking fun, but. I know a couple of regional directors for hospitals and they don't even like that type of stuff. Loosen up, I know, right? Dr. Breskin often thinks I'm a little too loose with my jokes, but hey, you guys keep entertained. That's all that matters. Are you not entertained? What else? Any questions I can answer from anyone? Doesn't matter. Nothing's off. I know. Exactly, Joan. Any que does, no question is off limits as far as home health goes, so I'll answer whatever you want. Anything I can answer about home health? How much could you make a year with home health? Um, so I know therapists that make over 100K at home health. I do. P and I'm talking PTAs that make over 100K with home health. Um, a lot. Yeah, I mean, you're going to you're gonna have to carry a consistent caseload, and you're probably going to have to work at least one day during the weekend. So, and get good at mapping, yep. You can make good money. You really can. I'm not going to dissuade you guys from doing home health. I just want you guys to understand it. It, it takes a little bit. You have to be a little savvy. You have to be a little smart. Um, and understand how to budget. Because you're going to burn through a lot of gas. You have to get a car that you don't care about just because you're gonna be putting a ton of miles on it, right? I wouldn't want, uh, like my truck chewed through a lot of miles when I came here doing home health. Um, when I was in Pennsylvania, I did home health on a motorcycle. I carried everything on the back of a bike. Um, that was really cheap, mainly because in Pennsylvania, patients can be up to 100 miles apart. Here it's not so much. The valley's only about 15 miles across. So um, are there, Always patients to see most of the time, Krista. So there are still going to be slow periods in home health. Um, you know, over Christmas period, it slows down a little bit again. Um, it's kind of, you know, it kind of ebbs and flows. And it depends upon who's doing surgeries. What you'll find is just like an outpatient clinic. When there's first of the year deductible, exactly. Yeah, usually you're, you're exactly right, Ashley. A lot of times January, February, we start picking up business just because people want to knock out their deductibles or maybe they don't want to because they've got that deductible. So it just depends on what I'm looking at. Um, the good news is PT counts towards their deductibles. So a lot of times if they can get PT, they will. Um, and then towards the end of the year, so like September, October, when they're starting to be into that where the, the insurance is paying everything, a lot of people want PT and want to use up their PT benefits. So it kind of ebbs and flows. What you'll see a lot of times is it depends on what the docs are doing. So one week you'll have a ton of total knees and the next week you have a ton of low backs and then you have a bunch of total hips and it just kind of ebbs and flows with it. You see that now patient as well. Exactly, right? It just depends upon the flavor of the month, flavor of the week. Um, yeah, when it, we should be sending them to outpatient as well. What's on sale? They should do that. That would make some money. Um, get, I, you know, Melissa, I can't tell you how get good at mapping is true. That is just 100%, 150% true. Any other questions? Anything else? Uh, the only thing, I'll, the only other thing I'll warn you guys about is transference. Does anyone know what transference is? I think I've talked about it before. So it's a psychological term. It's not a PT term. Transference, yes. Feelings, because you're taking care of the kids, or even it can happen if you're taking care of them, right? Transference is where that patient likes you a little bit more, maybe, than you like them. Just saying. Um, be aware that in that setting, you are by yourself. I'm not saying that you ladies are helpless, but be aware of that. You are by yourself. For men, be aware of your by, that you're by yourself and it's their word against yours. I'm just saying, same thing, you know, women tend to get believed a little bit more than we do. Um, and I think that's kind of wrong. 
record. Oh, it depends if your patient allows it. That's the thing. If they don't allow you to record, then what are you going to do? You can't in this state, you have to have bilateral permission to record. So it has to be on, you know, given, it has to be ex explained to them. And sometimes I might do that, but I'm going to explain. I'm just recording this so we have a record of your treatment here so you can go back and watch through it. Really, most of the time, if I might do that, it's because I'm concerned about the patient. Um, but yeah, so just be aware of that. You know, some, it's just some patients, you know, they think that you stretching their leg means they're it's more than just stretching their leg. Or because you're working on their low back, to giving them a low back massage that, well, other areas need massage. It's even in the outpatient clinic. Um, but just be aware of that at home health, that you're by yourself, right? Um, what happens if you're not comfortable treating a patient? You go to that patient, you see them, and you're not comfortable treating them again. If you can, hand off. Yep, pass them to somebody like me. I take a lot of those patients. I'll be 100% honest, and I'm pretty sure that even Melissa's husband might do that. I take a lot of those patients the other people don't want to see. Yep, and you hand it out, yeah. That's where you got to be concerned, right? Yep, it's, I hate to say it, guys, we got to worry about it. Let the agency know, though, yes, right? Um, I have the, the, one of the PTs I see a lot of my patients for in the home health setting, she's like gene sized. And she is not comfortable always going to, you know, bad areas of town. So a lot of those patients, she'll call me and see if I want to go see them for. Her. Absolutely. Pay me. Anything else? Euler. I'm going to stop recording.